silence that may be picked up by microphones located throughout the room. Also, please silence your cell phones. If you are participating virtually, please mute your microphones. And I will give everyone a moment just to get settled. We still have a couple of members joining us. I would like to take this time to thank Brian Clark, Executive Director of the North Carolina Ports for our tour of the Port of Wilmington. All participants found it extremely educational and enlightening. We, you were an excellent guide, Brian. <laughs> Several members who started this journey with us had to leave the task force for various reasons. We extend our appreciation to Gray Blount, Christina Goebel, and Lori Barnhart, and thank each for their service. But please join me in welcoming our new members. We have several joining us this morning. Daniel Gavoni from the Department of Environmental and Quality. Thank you, Daniel, for joining us. Arkita Howard with Crowley. I think she has not made it to the room yet. We have John White from Dominion Energy who's joining us virtually. Welcome, John and Greg Richardson of the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs, who has, uh, is not able to be with us this morning. At this time, we will take roll call. Nicole, if you would please perform roll call for us. Present. And if you are participating virtually as a member, please unmute your microphone uh, to acknowledge your presence. Hello, this is Justin Sosny. Hello, this is Perry Harker. Hello, Hayes Frommy with Horstead. Segovia. 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 Present. Alvin. John White. If a member is present whose name has not been called, please make yourself known. Also, we will like staff to introduce themselves at this time. If you would please stand and state your name.
All right, we do have a couple of special guests this morning. Tiara Strum of Strum Const Contracting is with us this morning. Also, uh, we are expecting some other guests to uh, from the Wilmington Chamber who have not arrived yet, but we will greet them once they do. If you are a guest or visitor, please um, state your name at this time. And if you are affiliated with an agency, please state the name of the agency as well. Baldwin representing Ethanol. Glenn Anderson, Cape Fear Ocean Labs. Sebastian Petzelak, Iron Workers, Mid Atlantic District. Thank you. Do we have any media present? All right, and just one note, um, we are live streaming and if you are trying to access the internet here, I can give you the code. It is uh, 501-C-O-N-F, 501-C-0, lowercase n, lowercase f. In accordance with the State Government Ethics Act, it is the duty of every task force member to avoid both conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts. If any member has any known conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to the matters coming before the task force today, please identify it at this time. Also, please identify any conflict with arises to any uh, matters discussed during the meeting so that it can be evaluated to ensure that any inappropriate participation is avoided. Okay, so I'd like to thank everyone for being here. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're jumping a little bit ahead of uh, where we had expected to be right now, but this is probably a good thing for Brian. So uh, we are Welcoming Brian Clark, our executive director of the North Carolina ports, also a member of the task force. He's going to do a presentation for us on the North Carolina ports. So with that, thank you, Brian. We'll just say under Brian's leadership, North Carolina ports completed critical infrastructure improvements, including container berth renovations, turning basin expansion, air draft improvements, and the addition of three new Neo Panamax cranes. And the Port of Wilmington was recognized by the Journal of Commerce as the most productive port in North Carolina and the fastest growing port, I'm, I'm sorry, in North America. We know it's North Carolina, but the most productive port in North America and the fastest growing port in the U.S. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much and good morning, everybody. Uh, for those that were able to join the tour yesterday, this will be some repeat information, but please, if there are any questions as we uh, make our way through the presentation, just ask. Um, I'm sorry. Can we get a microphone for Brian, please? Can you hear me now? Good morning. Okay, there we go. So I'll start over. Good morning, everybody. And for those that were able to join on the tour yesterday, this will be some repeat information, but if there are any questions along the way, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Very honored to be here today um, and present.
Morehead City is a bulk and break bulk facility, whereas we handle all cargoes down here in the port of Lincoln. From a numbers perspective, you can see the scale. Uh, we handle about 5,000 truck moves a week in our container gate. Uh, here in the Port of Wilmington, we handle about 330,000 TEUs of container cargo on an annual basis. So from a scale standpoint, we are fairly small, but we are growing. Uh, and we continue to invest in our facilities to ensure that we can handle cargo well into the future. We have about 4 million tons of general cargo between both of our facilities. So on the opposite end, we are actually one of the larger break and uh, break bulk facilities on the on the East Coast and the South Atlantic, at least operated by port authorities. A lot of port authorities on the East Coast have focused more on the container trade, uh, whereas the general cargoes are handled by private operations in, in the respective ports. The, 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 the focus that we placed on both container and general cargo has served us well over the last couple of years, particularly. And we will continue to focus as we move into the future uh, with that balance between container and general cargo at our facilities. We handle about 1,000 ship calls total between both port facilities, a number of large operations up in the Port of Moorhead City, and we continue to see those services grow uh, on an annual basis. We are operated as a business. We're somewhat unique in that respect. Uh, we are an agency of the state. We report to a board of directors. Is that me? Okay. We report to 11 member board of directors. We execute commercial contracts with our customers, uh, direct commercial contracts for the movement of goods across the wharfs at our facilities, uh, dockage facilities, as well as storage of that cargo. So from a revenue standpoint, we are dependent on those contracts to generate our revenue, to conduct our business. We do not receive any state appropriations for the operations at the ports. We are very fortunate. We do receive capital appropriations on an annual basis. We have for the last six years to reinvest in our port facilities and a lot of our discussion today will be on those projects that have brought us uh, brought us into a, a spot to be able to support the growing trade. Port of Wilmington, again, for those who didn't have a chance to tour it yesterday or might not have seen it in the uh, recent past, we do handle all cargo there, containers, bulk and break bulk. We are also a landlord for some portion of our warehouses. We operate, uh, we are Port, a, a hybrid port operation similar to the ports in South Carolina and Georgia. So state employees, we have about 220 total state employees at both ports. We actually operate the gates, we operate the cranes, and we operate the yard, operate the yard handling equipment. And that hybrid operation allows us to, to, hit, to receive the cargo through the gate and place it on the spot of rest. And then from that point going forward, we have a relationship with Stevedore and companies and the International Longshoremen's Association actually loads that cargo to the vessel and vice versa. Great relationship. It served us well, and we'll continue to work in that fashion going forward. We have just under 300 total acres on the main port of Wilmington. Uh, about a little over 100 of that, 100 acres of that, is focused on the container operation. The balance is on the general cargo uh, and bulk facilities. We do have a 42-foot channel. This is a focus of ours in the future to deepen the channel, to remain competitive in the container trade. Over the last number of years, as the Panama Canal was expanded, we've seen a, a quick uh, cascading of larger vessels onto the East Coast. Prior to the canal, the largest vessel is typically about 5,000 PEUs or 20-foot equivalents units. Right now, we're seeing vessels upwards of 15,000 TEUs falling in, on the major ports on the East Coast. The largest we've been able to handle to date is about a 14,200 TU vessel, 1,200 feet long. And again, a lot of the investments that we've made um, and the support from the state over the last number of years has allowed us to, to be competitive and support those vessel operations. We have about a million square feet of covered warehouse space. As I said, a portion of that is leased to a third party, uh, to different third parties, and the balance is operated by our employees. Moorhead City, as I said, we do not handle container traffic. So all 128 acres of the main port are focused on bulk and break bulk cargo. Another million square feet of covered warehouse space there. One of the recent uh, approvals from our board was to build out another 75,000 square foot warehouse. So it'll be the first new warehouse in Moorhead City in, in quite some time. And we also are uh, improving some outdoor st out outside storage uh, lay down yards to accommodate some of the growth there. We do have 150 acres on Radio Island that's undeveloped, um, certainly a focus of many in this room, uh, the opportunities uh, that could be uh, on that facility. 
natural deep water at 45 feet, four mile steam time from the ocean. Uh, so it puts uh, the Port of Moorhead City in a very good position from a competitive standpoint. We are served in North, uh, sorry, in Moorhead City by Norfolk Southern across the NCRR, and uh, down in Wilmington, we're served by CSX. Our last location is the Charlotte Inland Port. This is focused on intermodal traffic between uh, the Port of Wilmington and the Charlotte market and further west into the state. The service started in 2017. Too close to keep hearing some feedback. Good. Uh, this service started in 2017, uh, provided by CSX. It's a branded product by North Carolina Ports called the Clean City Express. And we move intermodal cargo uh, on a daily basis, overnight service out into the Charlotte market. We just recently started the Wilmington Midwest Express. I have another slide on that. But the benefit of the Charlotte Inland Port, we have immediate dray of the import cargo uh, from the CSX facility into our yard where we can store it for our customers and ultimately deliver it out. Same in reverse for export cargo that we can use to the Port of Wilmington. Our mission is simple. I said as a state agency, our focus is to be the gateway to global markets. So open up trade lanes through the Port of Wilmington and the Port of Moorhead City, and ultimately to reduce the cost for consumers and producers in the state. We measure our success in this by our economic impact. This last study was done in 2018. We are actually updating that study today. But over 87,000 jobs across the state are impacted by cargo moving across one of our two ports and over $15 billion of economic output on an annual basis. So we're very proud of these numbers. These have continued to grow over a series of uh, studies. And we expect when the newest study is released that we'll see an increase in these areas as well. As I said, a lot of our focus has been on the container trade. Uh, it's extremely competitive, particularly across South Atlantic ports. Uh, there's opportunities to grow. Our market today in North Carolina is about 3 million TEUs of cargo on an annual basis. And based on the numbers we shared in the first page, we're handling about 10% of that cargo. It differs between imports and exports. But as we study the state and the opportunities, you can see these key markets and key focus areas and key beneficial cargo owners that are moving, that are either established in the state, have uh, distribution centers, have headquarters, and so as we work together with, uh, with various groups around the state, we're focusing on trying to grow this business and capture the volumes through our ports. I mentioned the Wilmington Midwest Express. This is the new service that we started. Uh, it was a result of the Rocky Mountain facility opening up the CCX facility at the end of last year. That is a op uh, operation conducted by CSX. Um, it's a domestic intermodal service uh, within their network. We have a direct connection from Wilmington into Rocky Mountain, which gives us access into their broader network. So again, from a competitive standpoint, we need to ensure that we can reach these inland markets. It's not just a truck market. And as a carrier looking for ports and for markets, they want to be able to serve a, a very broad sector. So in the beginning of this year, we launched the Wilmington Midwest Express Service. Um, it is right now serving three inland points between Chicago, Northwest Ohio, and East St. Louis. And you can see some of the transit times between Wilmington, very competitive. Uh, we've been actively moving cargo across this uh, for the last several months. And again, bringing new service to our customers to be able to take advantage of. We touched on the Queen City Express earlier. Uh, extremely important for us to be able to serve what is traditionally a truck market, especially in times of, of high diesel fuel uh, costs. And we've seen these volumes just in the last year ramp up significantly based on uh, based on some of the challenges with, with driver availability, fuel costs, and, and the like. Overnight service into the Charlotte market, quick tray out of the, the CSX facility and onto uh, the endpoint. Arketa mentioned it earlier, we're extremely proud from a service standpoint on our container operation. As I said, extremely competitive amongst ports. The importance of speed um, between, to the carrier community and the trucking community cannot go understated. So from our focus, we look at truck turn times, how quickly we can get a driver onto the port and out of the port, whether they're doing a single or a dual move. And on the vessel side, it's, it's measured in crane productivity. How fast can we turn a vessel? How many cranes can we deploy on the chip at a time? Uh, it's typically based off volume. 
from a productivity standpoint, uh, the last year's full uh, productivity, full year productivity finished at 39 net moves per hour per crane. So you deploy three or four cranes on a ship, you're moving upwards of 160 containers per hour. The last time the Journal of Commerce issued the rankings, we were actually ranked as the number one performing port in North America. So it's something we're extremely proud of. It's actually, uh, it's a measure that the cust our customers communicate. It's not a measure we share. Uh, so the fact that our customers can see the service levels we are providing and, and they're willing to share that information uh, makes it that much more special. So it's an area we'll continue to focus on. The truck turn times, again, extremely important to be able to dr turn drivers as quickly as possible, get them back out, whether they're doing a, a short drop or a long haul move. But the, the last thing they want is to be sitting in a vessel, uh, sorry, in a gate queue or sitting on a port for hours on end. Our single turn times from gate to gate. So when a driver gets to our inbound gate, gets his routing mission, and then gets the interchange receipt getting out, is measured at 19 minutes on an annual basis. So that's an average across all of our moves, and a dual move at 32 minutes, both extremely competitive. Mentioned earlier, very fortunate on an annual basis, we received $45 million for capital improvements at our port facilities. And over the last number of years, a lot of the focus has been placed on the container operation, extremely competitive. Um, and our customers issued us a challenge back when the canal was opening up. We had to be prepared to handle, at that time, it was expected to be 9,500 TU vessels, the largest vessels that would have been moving through the canal by 2016. And in order to do that, the first step in that process was to have the turning basin, an initial phase of the turning basin dredge. But what we saw, the industry was quickly evolving, and these vessels were cascading at a much faster rate. And as I said earlier, over 16,000 TU vessels are now falling the East Coast. We went through a series of improvement projects to be able to remain competitive in that area. We had to complete two berth expansions. Uh, those on the tour yesterday saw the three container berths. We have 2,600 feet between the three of them. And we have seven post and Neo Panamax cranes. So we had to complete two of those berth renovations in order to support these larger cranes that we had on order. They arrived in 2018 and 2019. And quickly after that, we found that we had to further expand the turning basin. So we went through a phase two of that turning basin expansion which now is over 1,500 feet across uh, the, the Cape Fear River. It allows the, the pilots to turn a vessel over 1,200 feet long. So that's really the, the target size we were working towards as we designed this, this project. But it didn't stop with just the berths and the cranes. Obviously, we needed to be, ensure that we could handle the cargo through the port itself mm -hmm. and through the gate. In February of this year, we just opened our new gate complex. That's the picture in the, the bottom center. Um, it essentially doubled the size of our gate lanes at the port, for those who have seen it previously. Uh, so we went from uh, a, a small gate complex with seven total lanes to now a total of 13 lanes in and out. We also int introduced new technology to make the gate that much more efficient, as well as a terminal operating system and gate operating system backbone uh, to manage the, the operation. We had to address the air draft across the river. That was one of our challenges. And we undertook that with our partners at Duke Energy. Uh, they actually designed the project. Uh, it was a cost share between us and them. Again, great support from the state from a preparation standpoint. But it took what was a air draft limitation of 171 feet and raised it to 212 feet. The standard we were working towards as we worked along with Duke Energy was the Bayonne Bridge on the East Coast. It uh, was a, a project up in the Port of New York, New Jersey. It took a bridge that was 150 feet and went up to 215 feet. And that was really the standard. So it puts us in a great competitive advantage uh, position. Uh, there are ports to the south of us that have restrictions with bridges about 186 feet. So again, as we, we work to, uh, to attract new services, we wanted to make sure all impediments to doing business in the Port of Wilmington were removed. And that brought us to the beginning of 2020. Uh, right when the pandemic started, we had completed all of our projects. We had the cranes online, the turning basin done, uh, berths completed. Uh, but we actually were fortunate to welcome at that time was the largest vessel, just over 13,000 TEUs in one of our Trans-Pacific services um, arrived in, in May of 2020. So a lot of work went into getting the facilities. Um, and as I said, focusing initially on the container operation be in a position to support new trade. And you can see the image here. This is not the vessel, but these are our three Neo Panamax cranes uh, to the north, or four uh, post Panamax cranes to the south. 
Um, and this is about a 14,000 TU vessel alongside our Dark Earth today. A couple images of two of the key projects, Turning Basin, which is located just to the north of our main port. Um, we, in that image, you can see our berth number one, which involves uh, rerouting some uh, tank bridges uh, from the tank farm on our north, uh, north end of our property and allows the, uh, the Turning Basin uh, and the pilots to, to handle the vessels uh, coming into the harbor. And then the bottom right, uh, sorry, the right side is the uh, air draft uh, project with power lines across the river. So as we look from a cargo set, we're in a very good position here from a, an export market. And so a lot of our focus has been on how we attract new import volumes in order to ensure the equipment is available for that export market. The refrigerated trade is a great example. Uh, the export refrigerated trade here is significant, and we've been able to capture a, a good percentage of it over the last number of years, but it required a lot of investment as well. Uh, we had a very small complement of refrigerated container plugs on the port, so we undertook a project to introduce what is known as reefer racks. Uh, we had a good laugh at some of the terminology yesterday, but uh, a reefer is a refrigerated container. It requires port power while it's stored on the port, and it has power on board the ships or on the trucks as they're moving. We introduced the first phase of this refrigerated reefer yard uh, with 540 new plugs. And we just recently approved phase, or the board just recently approved phase two of this project. We'll introduce another 700 plus plugs and lay the groundwork for phase three of our, our refrigerated container yard. This was extremely important, especially as we started attracting new import volumes uh, to complement the export volume that we have. And again, another highlight of the, the new gate complex, this is extremely excited. It's an automated gate. Um, it's, it's really driven by the use of a community access portal with our trucking community. They pre-advise their transactions. They can do so for about a week in advance. But as that driver arrives, uh, we have all the, the back supporting information between dr uh, driver's IDs, uh, license plates, and, and the such to be able to capture all that information in an automated fashion. And eventually when the driver gets to the inbound gate, we saw that yesterday on the tour, if all that data matches up um, and is aligned with what was pre-advised to us, that driver is gating into the yard automatically. We're seeing great efficiency through the gate. It's really allowed us to, to not only have additional capacity, but this gate facility itself can actually handle over a million TEUs of cargo a year. So between the berths and the work we're doing in the yard, our target is to continue to grow our capacity, grow the actual utilization of that capacity um, in what is a, a very competitive and very important market. But as we look forward, it's not just all containers. Uh, we are investing in the general cargo facilities. We have started the new warehouse in Moorhead City and some additional lay down yards. We are looking at our crane capacity, our general cargo crane capacity in both ports um, because it is equally as important. It represents about 50% of our revenue on an annual basis is, is derived from the general cargo side. Um, and so we will continue to focus to expand our cargo volumes, not just on the container, but across all segments. And we will continue to look to expand our global reach. It's critical that we have the capacity and we have the capability to reach more markets than we do today. Because ultimately, if a, a shipper or a consumer can't reach a, a global point through our port, they're going to go elsewhere. They're going to either move, go to the north or south of us to move their cargo, and we want to try to capture as much as possible. Last year, we issued our 2021 five-year strategic plan. These are the, the key pillars that are contained in that plan. As I said, we want to re expand our global reach, grow our volumes. We want to continue to um, engage with our economic development partners across the state. We've, we've worked very closely um, over the last several years. We want to continue to expand on that and utilize the ports as a tool for those economic development projects. And ultimately, we want to continue to develop our talent pipeline. Uh, there's a lot of focus placed in the state, a lot of opportunities, um, but it will, will lead to a lot of demand on the talent that we have, not just internally, but externally as well. We want to help. Uh, with those uh, with those plans moving forward. And obviously our end goal is to continue to build the M NC Ports brand. Uh, we are re globally recognized for the service that we can provide and we do provide. And we want to continue to, to grow those volumes and ultimately reduce the cost for moving goods in and out of the state of North Carolina. So this is actually the last slide. Um, I do know there was some questions about where we stand with uh, with our assets, um, particularly Radio Island. So I'll, I'll address those. Uh, the questions came up over the last couple of days. 
We do have the 150 acres um, in on Radio Island. Uh, two two steps have taken place over the last number of uh, months or, or last year. The first is we applied for and received a, a port infrastructure development grant uh, through Marad. Uh, that that grant is underway. Uh, we've engaged with Marad and are waiting on the final uh, grant uh, agreement. That grant will actually rebuild the lead track and the storage tracks that have been on Radio Island for some time, but have fallen into disrepair. So that was the first step in the process. And the second, um, about a month ago, we submitted to the state clearinghouse um, our uh, EIS, uh, Environmental Impact Study um, Objectives, and we're working through that public comment period, which expires next week. Um, and then we'll move forward with the the actual study, which will take approximately 18 months. So we received some initial comments back um, from some of the our respective agencies. But once that period closes out, we'll, we'll move forward. Our engineering company will move forward, taking into account those those comments that we've received. So that's the uh, the overview. Uh, I appreciate the time and the opportunity, and I appreciate the the time everybody took yesterday for the tour. Um, I don't know if there's time for questions. But I'm there, there is. Do we have any questions for Brian, Kevin, Dick? Brian, thanks for the tour yesterday, and thanks for this great presentation. Kevin, can you speak louder into the microphone? I'm sorry, uh, Brian. Thanks for the tour yesterday and for this great presentation. I had a few questions. Yes. Um, with on the uh, capital improvements plan, what is the? I, I've noticed that there were a couple of aspects that were complete, and then there's still some that are underway. What is the estimated, I guess, ETA for the completion of the entire plan? Sure. And and kind of related to that, are there any things, any aspects of the plan that are still under bid or are not under bid, being bid? Understood. Right. Can we get the PowerPoint back up, please? Thank you. I'll put that slide back up so we can talk to it. So th this was focused, this list that you see here is focused on our uh, container yard master plan that we executed about three years ago to kind of identify where our, our bottlenecks were and what projects need to be undertaken. We talked about the birth expansion, the air draft and the cranes, they are complete. The cranes obviously are operational. Um, we have the turning basin phase one and two are complete. The container yard master plan is the overall plan itself. So each of the projects where we look at you know, reefer yard phase two, or perhaps uh, a five or six acre section of the yard that needs to be rebuilt to increase our, our capacity. That it will be underway for, for a number of years. Um, within that, we have a, an active project that is uh, getting ready. It's about a six acre section of the yard that will be completed next, actually at the end of this month. Um, we will then go into phase two of the reefer project. That project has already been bid uh, and awarded. Uh, that contractor will kick off as soon as this, this sec other section completes. And then year over year, we'll move through the yard in, in different phases uh, for future projects that will be bid out. The Wilmington Harbor Navigation Improvement Project is the deepening project for the Cape Fear River. So in uh, the, the project that we submitted, the 203 study was uh, conditionally authorized through WERBA 2020. Uh, we are working with the local district to address those conditional items. Um, and finalize and get final authorization to move forward with the deepening project. Again, great support from the state. Uh, the non-federal share of that project is fully funded, and we will work through the, the typical process on the federal side to uh, keep appropriations moving forward for their share of the project. Okay, so the, so overall, the capital capital improvements plan is that a DOT capital improvements plan, or is that 
This is an NC ports plan. This is identified by our my ports employees. Uh, we will then, as a project elevates to the, to the top of the, the priority list, we'll submit it to our board for approval. And we will manage our capital uh, plan in a pay as you go process to ensure that we never you know, outrun our, our funding source. Okay. Um, and, it, and it consists of a lot more than this. It's covered both ports um, and is a, um, it's, You'd say it's somewhat nimble uh, based on commercial opportunities, but it's clearly focused on elevating the, the physical condition of the assets. The, the last question I had was, can you distinguish between um, the revenue gener the, the revenue figure and the um, cash generated figure? Yes, so the capital appropriations that we receive are, are geared on expansion projects. Um, on the port, but we do have four capital projects and we will, based on our financial performance on an annual base, uh, on an annual basis, that's $12 million uh, of cash will be focused on those four projects that we generate on an annual basis. I think that, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Think, okay, so so the cash generated is based upon the the projects that are being done I, I, I think I understand. I'll, I'll talk. Off. Okay. I'll ask you. Thank you. You got it. All right. Steve, you have questions? Steve Calland. If we still have time. So this is a great presentation kind of gives a good overview of everything going on. And I, I know you guys are in growth mode. I came down to visit you guys around a, a different project in a different space in the clean energy uh, world a couple months back and got a tour as well. One thing I was curious about, though, this is a good overview of kind of the generic you know, ports need to do these things. I'm not a ports expert by any stretch, but I have been watching kind of news articles about activities of other ports up and down the East Coast, particularly up the East Coast, that are doing very specific things tied to the wind industry to try and attract this particular industry. And because of the nature of the construction of, of wind projects, there are some things that I guess are specific to wind that maybe wouldn't normally be on the list. I'm wondering if you guys have done any benchmarking looking at some of those projects up and down the East Coast and whether any of those types of things are uh, being contemplated. And I will say that I'm not even probably smart enough to tell you what those things are, but perhaps some of our industry folks, uh, Jamie or Ashley or somebody that's more directly engaged in that discussion might have a couple of ideas. Not meaning to put you on the spot, Jamie. <laughs> I, I don't answer the question generally. I, yeah. We are very aware of what's going on up and down the coast, so particularly up the coast. Uh, we are engaged uh, with uh, some of the conferences. We are engaged with some of the stakeholders that are uh, trying to make a presence in the space. Um, so we're we're aware of opportunities, um, and they'll be evaluated just as any other economic development opportunity going forward. I think it's probably a, a general answer. Uh, Phyllis Craig Taylor. Mr. Clark, thank you for the presentation and for the informative tour on yesterday. You hit one bullet point on the slide uh, referring to your strategic plan that spoke to talent and pipeline development. Can you provide any other details about that particular bullet point? Yes, so it's a plan in, in motion. Um, obviously, it's extremely critical from our standpoint to ensure that we have the right talent, we attract the right talent, and we retain the right talent as NC Ports employees. So we have a number of initiatives underway working with the, the local community colleges uh, for training opportunities. We have deployed a what is known as Ports U, Ports University, um, for continuing education that any of our employees can take advantage of. And then there's the like with, you know, uh, for advanced degrees that would be supportive of uh, that, that would support someone's role with the ports. So that's looking internally. Externally, that is definitely a, a, a work in progress. But as we see the expansion around our port, a lot of the economic development projects that we're trying to work closely on will bring new jobs to the local community and to the region itself. And so we wanna ensure that as, we, as we're as we successful in those local projects and those investments that we help kind of raise the bar of the talent pool in the communities that we operate in. Um, because at the end of the day, if, if those investors can't get the talent that they require, it's certainly not gonna help. It won't have a, a positive downstream effect for us. Daniel, do you have a question? 
Thank Daniel you, Gaboni. Thank you, Brian. Real quick question. Could the increase of Brian, I'm off? sorry, Daniel, can you speak to the microphone a little bit closer, please? Can you hear me now? I, I can would the increase of supplies for offshore wind increase the tonnage for the ports? Therefore, would the Corps receive additional dredge money? Therefore, benefiting the ports and, and other offsets of that? I would believe so. Uh, it's something I think we certainly want to look okay. into to ensure that that tonnage is calculated in the, the overall port tonnage. Do we have any more questions for Brian? Uh, any of our virtual members, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute your microphone or type your question into the chat. Do we have any more questions for Brian? I do not see any in the chat. Thank you, Brian, Thank for you that. Thank you for the opportunity. Report and for the tour. It was uh, very important. Okay, we're going to deviate a little bit and welcome our special guest, Natalie English from the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce. And Natalie, we really appreciate the warm welcome from the Chamber of Commerce and the support of our mission. And we do invite you to say a few words to the task force. Thank you, Marquita. Again, for those of you I have not met, I'm Natalie English. I'm president and CEO of the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce. Uh, earlier this year, the board of the chamber uh, adopted a resolution in full support of North Carolina's efforts to attract the offshore wind industry that with the opportunity that we have with the lease right off our coast. We're excited about those opportunities. We know that it will contribute significantly to economic growth in southeastern North Carolina and across the entire state. And we're thrilled to be partners with you and stand ready to do whatever we need to help you. Welcome to Wilmington. Spend lots of money while you're here and have a lot of fun. It's a great place. And when you're ready to come back and get a job here, I'll be happy to help. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. We appreciate the welcome and, and the support. We're going to deviate just slightly again because we are ahead of schedule. And so I'm going to ask our team members, Jennifer Munt, to come talk with us briefly uh, and share her experience about when Europe and what she learned there. <laughs> and John, you're, you're on cue to follow her. <laughs> I told Madam Chairman that she can always put me in coach whenever necessary. So she did. And Jennifer, if um, you mind going to the podium, that way our guests can see. I'm sorry? If you don't mind going to the podium. That way. Oh, I don't mind. I knew Jennifer could handle it. And, and by the way, I, we didn't invite Murphy, but Mr. Law wants to make his, his presence known with our technical issues this morning, but we'll get through them. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, can y'all hear me? Okay, I'll try not to induce feedback. So in the first week of April, I traveled with several uh, North Carolina state agency colleagues, uh, Lance Kenworthy representing the ports, Susie Hamilton, who is a member of our distinguished task force, and um, Colin Kaiser, who's formerly with um, Economic Department, uh, Economic Development Partnership with North Carolina, and one of the EDPNC representatives who is based in the EU, Luigi Mercury. And we were there, it was in Bilbao, Spain, and there were approximately 8,000 people there, Susie. Um, representing both on and offshore wind interests, but I would note that offshore wind was definitely the most popular discussion topic in in the place. Uh, we heard a lot of plenary conversations from CEOs across the industry and the sector speaking to the need to increase the uh, the timing and the and the uh, implementation of offshore wind and other renewable energy resources in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and helping to secure domestic, meaning wherever uh, wherever you were from, 
uh, resources of energy resilience and resources in order to uh, reduce reliance on foreign providers of energy. And so that was a refrain that was shared in many venues across and from uh, several voices and perspectives. Um, amongst ourselves, we were able to uh, meet with several um, with several tier one, two, and three manufacturers up and down the supply chain for offshore wind. Uh, we uh, we were able to make those connections and then continue them by uh, setting up meetings with folks who we knew would be attending the International Partnering Forum, which John will speak to here in a few minutes. And so we're really starting to develop and foster relationships with companies or um, trade associations who are interested in North Carolina as a partner in the offshore wind supply chain space. Really excited about that. Folks see North Carolina as a great opportunity for investment in the supply chain for offshore wind. Um, sorry, it's a little something flying around here. Um, one of one, one of the highlights for me and something that was really uh, brought home was participating in a in a tour of the port of Bilbao where um, RWE and um, I'm not going to remember the name of the, the company right now are developing a pilot for um, floating offshore wind and they're piloting a one of the four um, foundation or I should say lack of foundation technologies that will support floating offshore wind in the future and just seeing the uh, the scope and the size and the scale of the equipment that's going to be necessary to support floating offshore wind was really eye-opening to me the um, the floating barge that was under construction was from um, from bottom to top 30 feet tall and made of cast um, steel and concrete and it was only designed to pilot a two megawatt turbine. And so if they're gonna scale that for the size of the turbines that they anticipate in, um, in those deep waters, 15, meg 15 megawatts and above, they anticipate that the size of that floating barge will have to scale to the size of a soccer field pitch and multiplied by however many to create the, the uh, wind farm that they, um, that they Produce. So just seeing that size and scale was um, pretty telling to me and also getting a really good understanding of where North Carolina can maybe slide into that floating offshore wind opportunity, given that the uh, that Boeing just announced last week at the IPF that they are got, that they're moving forward with a call for information and nominations for the Central Atlantic. Um, uh, wind energy area opportunities. We have they've identified two potential areas off of our north, our northern coasts. One area just east of the Kitty Hawk area that was already identified, and then another area that is way further east beyond the drop off in the continental shelf that would necessarily require floating technology. And just thinking about how North Carolina might be able to pioneer that in the um, in the scaled space um, is pretty exciting. And so I think those are my main remarks, Marquita. If I'm missing anything, I, I invite Susie to share any of her uh, her experiences, but I'm happy to turn the mic over to John and this little gnat that's flitting around too. He could deal with that next. Susie, do you have anything you want to add to the when you experience? Not at this time. I, I think Jennifer did it. Did a great, can you hear me? Usually I don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, Jennifer did a great job describing it. I, I think that um, what I found, um, speaking of scale, most exciting was just the, 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 the number and the, um, the size of the crowd there and, that, and, and just the, the absolute uh, commitment based on um, what's happening in Ukraine at this time. Um, the absolute commitment to reduce dependencies on natural gas and, and oil, you know, globally, not just targeting one area necessarily. But but it was a refrain that that we did hear. It um, was it contextualized most of the most of the conference itself, and and I believe so in a good way. So it seems that there's a lot of cooperation and goodwill. Um, EU and UK made a very 
big deal out of their um, uh, being um, in solidarity on this commitment to reduction. So um, it was an uplifting conference um, in, a, in a really exciting and beautiful part of the world. When we flew over, you could see um, across the ridge line of the mountain coming in all of the wind turbines. So um, it's exciting. We, it was an honor to, to be able to attend and represent North Carolina. Thanks, Mark Eden. Thanks. Thank you, Susie, and uh, my apologies to Jennifer and those uh, members who are listening who don't know who Jennifer is. Jennifer is our Assistant Director of Clean Energy for the Department of Commerce. Thank you for sharing those comments, Jennifer. And now, John Harden, who is the Executive Director of the Office of Science, Technology, and Innovation, will share uh, the International Partnership Forum experience. Yes, so last week, Last Tuesday through Thursday in Atlantic City, New Jersey, the um, International Partnering Forum, um, which is an offshore wind focused conference organized by the Business Network for Offshore Wind, took place. And I was able to attend along with Marquita and Jennifer. Um, Aaron Brott from the ports was there, as well as Anders Victor from the EDPNC. Ashley McLeod, who's here today, was there. Uh, we will claim you as representing North Carolina, although she was representing Avon Grid Renewables as well. And um, we were there along with about um, 3,000 other people um, from the U.S. and uh, across the globe. They, this conference is normally held in the spring. Last year, it was held last August due to COVID, and it was held in Richmond, and there were only about 1,200 people there. So the difference between last the last conference and this conference is that COVID restrictions have been lifted. And many, many, many more of the participants that were there this year were from overseas as opposed to just the US. It was an excellent conference. They had plenary sessions. They had breakout sessions on every topic you could imagine. The North Carolina delegation spent most of the time not in those sessions, but actually meeting with companies. Many of those were tier one developers, both national and international, um, as well as some tier two and tier three developers. Everything we heard at the conference basically ground truth what, what we've learned from the readings that we've had in our work group. Um, and I staffed the first working group, which will, um, or subcommittee, which will be presenting today. Um, and uh, there was a heavy focus on the industry supply chain, heavy focus on workforce. And Marquita, Jennifer, and I actually didn't, attended a workforce focused session um, on most of the day or half of the day on Tuesday. And what's, what's comforting for me about attending a conference like this is it's easy to think when you're in your home state that everybody else is doing better than you are. But everybody I learned faces the same challenges that we do. We are not behind the curve. We are, we are right there. Uh, some of the Northeastern states are slightly ahead of us, but that's only because they had a head start. I think we're catching up. And um, they, it was a very positive conference. We have a lot of interest in North Carolina. I'm getting emails as we speak from people that we've met at the conference wanting to have follow-up meetings. And um, North Carolina is on the radar of a lot of people. So, and we told everyone about this task force they were very interested. They also were very interested in our ports, as well as the manufacturing opportunity. So, um, great, great conference. I'm glad I was able to join Jennifer and Marquita. Thank you, John. Any questions for John or Jennifer? And there is a lot of interest in North Carolina ports and North Carolina generally for this industry, particularly our tier two and three uh, businesses with the strong uh, manufacturing that we have here in North Carolina. But does anyone have questions for Jennifer or John? Thank you, John. Thank you, Jennifer. We're gonna move on to the next item of, on our agenda, the Offshore Wind Business Panel. And we're ready for a robust conversation on economic development opportunities in North Carolina in the offshore wind industry. This panel is gonna be moderated by Susan Fleetwood, Susan is the Executive Director of Economic Development for the North Carolina Department of Commerce. Susan, we welcome you to, uh, and our guests this morning include, uh, in person with us joining us is Tira, Tira Strum, who you met earlier. 
Tierra is the CEO of Strum Contracting Company, a custom welding and light fabrication business based in Baltimore, Maryland, which happens to be an ISO 9001 certified company essential for, to do business in this industry. Strum Construction Company has provided professional welding services to the US to US Wind and other industry companies. So thank you, Tierra, for joining us. Welcome. Joining us virtually are Sam Eaton, Executive Vice President, America's Offshore Development for RWE, one of the largest energy companies in Europe, the world's number two offshore wind power generator, and Europe's third largest in renewable energy. Also a potential bidder for Wilmington East Lease, which you'll hear about uh, this afternoon. Also joining us, Scott Hewitt Gudgeon, Senior Director of U.S. Offshore Business Project Services for Ivan Grid Renewables. Ivan Grid is a provider of clean renewable power in the U.S. with more than 7,000 megawatts of owned and controlled wind and solar power facilities. Ivan Grid was awarded the lease for Kitty Hawk Offshore Wind Project and is also a potential bidder for the Wilmington East lease. Rebecca Karp is joining us. She's the managing partner and CEO of Karp Strategies, a trusted advisory business for real estate developers, energy companies, community organizations, and government agencies with extensive experience in planning, analysis, and stakeholder development. Sam Salustro, Director of Coalitions and Strategic Partnerships for Business Network of Offshore Wind, uh, we just met, saw Sam in, uh, at the IPF conference. Sam was gracious enough to join us this morning. Offshore Wind, uh, the Business Network of Offshore Wind is a nonprofit focused on developing the offshore wind renewable energy industry and its supply chain via education, collaboration, and innovation. The conference that John uh, Hardin just spoke about brought nearly 3,000 attendees representing nearly 800 businesses from across 25 countries. So IPF is the uh, premier offshore wind nonprofit and activist for this industry here in the U.S. So we'd like to welcome our guests and I turn it over to Susan. Thank you, uh, Marquita. Uh, Marquita has assembled a, a pretty impressive a group of experts here for us to spend some time with this morning. And Susan, you're going to probably have to ask me to uh, to moderate that discussion. I am no expert in offshore wind, and so that could be a good thing or a bad thing. But I have the um, uh, uh, dual role of trying to have an engaging conversation and also keeping us on time. So if you see me looking at my Fitbit, it's not because I need to take some steps, it's because I'm just making sure that we're uh, we're keeping on track. Um, and what I thought we might do is um, have um, uh, a series of questions for our panelists uh, based on each subcommittee topic. Um, and so um, I will um, ask uh, some of these questions and, and give uh, each panelist um, uh, kind of the initial opportunity to respond, and then um, if others want to um, uh, also chime in, that that's welcome. And um, and, and as we have time, I'd love for members of uh, the committee to also uh, ask questions. So um, hopefully we can we can kind of keep it as as a, a good interactive discussion. And so um, then, can you hold the microphone closer, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, our first group of questions are related to um, economic development and business development. And um, I'll start with Scott. Um, so Avon Grid, as, as we all know, is in the early process of uh, developing the Kitty Hawk project. Um, but as a major offshore developer with lots of experience, um, we're interested to know if you have any advice for North Carolina um, as to what we should be doing now uh, to prepare for potential supply chain opportunities for our companies. Hi, uh, firstly, can you hear me okay? Perfect, excellent. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me along. Um, really appreciate it. Um, in terms of response to your question, how I'd answer that is doing what you're doing right now, which is you're engaging with the industry, you're engaging with the existing supply chain, uh, and try and learn as much as you can about offshore wind in terms of the practical aspects, okay? Um, in terms of developing the projects, engineering the projects, 
executing and then obviously eventually operating the projects. Um, once you've understood how these projects are developed, engineered, executed, then operated, take a look at what you've already got within your region, your existing skill sets, and see where you can find um, synergies, uh, uh, where we can use what you've already got straight away, or where with minor modifications you can tweak the skills and experience that you have to, to support the offshore wind uh, industry, or then, or maybe where you want to focus your efforts in investing more funds to create new industries and supply chain. My advice would be, be strategic. Don't try and do everything, okay? Focus on what you're good at and, um, and uh, 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 hopefully things that already fit your, your skills and experience. Once you've done that, I then possibly start working with the higher education, uh, higher education institutes, uh, looking for opportunities for training, uh, uh, depending on the areas that you've decided to focus on. Does that, does that make sense? That's great. Yes, thanks. So, Tierra, um, as the CEO of a custom welding uh, and light uh, fabrication business, what advice can you give for small businesses that are interested in becoming a supplier in the offshore wind industry? And specifically, are there special certifications that are needed? What are they? How much do they cost? Where do you get them? What, what kind of uh, information can you share for smaller businesses? Well, I first say to, to piggyback off of uh, Scott's comments, it's it's really trying to understand um, what your current skill sets are currently and being able to piggyback off of that. Um, there may be some tweaking that small businesses may need to do, but you may in, in certain aspects already have what you need in order to perform form the job. It's just making those small modifications and or shifting to be able to align what the need is and then providing the services and products that you probably already do right now within the industry. But to answer your question um, from small businesses, um, I just found out last week uh, from your governor that North Carolina was a number one manufacturing, a uh, number one in manufacturing, uh, number one state in manufacturing in the Eastern Seaboard. That, that, that's awesome. That's amazing. So with when it comes to manufacturing, um, most of your companies probably already have it. For instance, um, I can speak to a construction aspect and Rebecca Karp is here that she can really talk to more so from the professional development side for professional services, sorry. Um, but within, if you're trying to get into the offshore wind industry, at least everything that I've seen, it's, it's various certifications such as an ISO 9001 certification um, at, at the very, very base minimum. And since North Carolina is already well positioned in the manufacturing industry, many of you, many of the manufacturers may already have that certification, which flows very nicely into the supply chain. If they do not, that is one of um, a certification that firms may want to think about getting if they want to provide a manufacturer product that will go on, for instance, a turbine or maybe a, um, a charging, I mean, a station, a substation. Um, that must be ISO 9001 certified. Um, there are also other different types of certifications uh, that uh, firms may look into, but we have to be very vigilant in identifying what areas of work that firms would like to get into because getting an ISO certification takes about, about a year. Um, and if you're really talking about a very small company trying to take on that, um, that uh, undertaking, you know, that could be upwards of 15 to $20,000. Um, we spent probably about $15,000 getting a certification, trying to get into an industry that everybody is looking like, how do we, you know, make our, our make our entrance into. So um, it is, I will say a upfront cost um, that you have to determine if this is something you want to invest in to seek out an opportunity within the offshore wind industry. Rebecca, from the professional services side, do you have any um, suggestions about uh, businesses who are interested in, in entering the offshore wind market? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for the question and just really delighted to be part of the conversation. Thank you for having me. You know, I come at this from the perspective of a community economic development, you know, stakeholder engagement consulting firm, you know, and I'm working with state agencies, city agencies, developers, you know, so really kind of courts all all sides of the conversation. So I think, you know, my comments are very similar to what you've already heard. So it's all about transferable skills, you know, and so thinking about how do you reach out to 
professional service firms, whether they be stakeholder engagement specialists, marketing firms, um, graphic designers, accountants, you know, really across the spectrum, permitting, you know, environmental services, really every single service that developers might need or that, frankly, the state of North Carolina, Carolina might need to be supporting this the development of this whole new industry um, and that you'll be required to have or that you might want to have involved for development of local content and local economic development. What I have found in working in New York, New Jersey, Maine, a bit of Massachusetts, is it really comes down to awareness and that many professional services firms, frankly, just haven't, they, ha they don't know about offshore wind. So at the IPF conference last week, you know, Tiara and I were talking about this, none of my competitors were there. And it was, it's shocking, especially about in the MWBE, the minority women owned business community. I was like, where is everybody? You know, I'm a huge advocate for thinking about small businesses and minority and women owned businesses and how we can make the pie bigger in the offshore wind supply chain to be sharing opportunities. And um, I think there's like a huge opportunity in North Carolina to be doing that outreach early and often and thinking about how you can work with state programs or city programs or your small business development centers to really get the word out because you have the firms that have the skills. It's just about how do you let them know about the opportunities in the industry? You know, how do you then connect them with developers or connect them with opportunities at the state level? Um, and how do you prepare them for doing for doing the work? Because you know, contracting with a with a big global developer is very different than contracting with a state agency, for example. So you know, the, the opportunities are there. It's about the outreach, the education, the awareness. Great, thank you. Sam, um, uh, Easton, based on uh, your, Eaton, sorry, based on your work uh, in the developing the supply chain for, for, for RWE, um, what have you observed as some of the biggest obstacles that uh, businesses that are interested um, in being part of the supply chain have faced? Thanks for the question for the opportunity to be with you today. I apologize in advance that I wasn't able to, to join you in person. I was really looking forward to being back home in North Carolina, uh, but unfortunately schedules just didn't align. For RWE, it really picks up on many of the themes that we've heard from Rebecca and Tierra of making those connections with the local businesses. Um, we are a large company, multi-billion dollar company, has have operations all across the world. Um, and we're used to dealing with similar entities that are similarly large um, types of, of companies, as well as the OEMs that we typically work with. They're similarly used to dealing with larger companies. And so it, it is really, for us, a necessary component of our work um, that we've been developing over the last decade or so to make that engagement with the local community to be able to find those opportunities to work together. And with that, we've put together Pathfinder programs all over the world um, that have allowed us to identify those opportunities with the local businesses, bring them into our supply chain in advance, plan ahead um, for those types of investments that Tiara had mentioned, that uh, Rebecca had mentioned are necessary in order to be part of the industry, um, but also to work with our supply chain members to identify what's already in place, um, rather than assuming that we need to start from scratch um, everywhere we go in, in the industry. I also have to endorse uh, the program here with NC Towers and the work that Jennifer and Jeremy have been doing. Um, it really is fantastic to see the state taking out a, a first step and really getting going in a way that uh, we've seen be successful, uh, not only here in other markets in the US, but also around the world. And with that, I think North Carolina is taking the right steps to, to really get in front of the supply chain opportunities um, that the offshore wind industry can bring. Great. Sam, uh, you, you mentioned um, kind of these pathfinder uh, opportunities. Um, Sam Salustro, I wonder if you could share, uh, based on, on your interactions with other states, if there are specific state, if specific, specific things state or local governments um, can do to, to help businesses access the offshore wind supply chain. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Um, uh, we've um, I'm very excited for everything that's going on in North Carolina. Uh, I'm, I'm, I try to be as helpful as possible to Jeremy, Jennifer, uh, and your team there. And uh, I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record. Uh, it's it's about visibility, education, and scaling. It's it's uh, it's like Rebecca talked about under getting businesses to even understand that the opportunity is there for them. That's an extensive outreach process that can be done on the local level, on the state level. Here at the business network, we we try to do that ourselves too, and you know that's what I spend half my time doing, which is literally you know 
getting in front of as many economic development boards as possible just to make sure that they can translate to their members what the opportunity is. Second is education. You know, you finally get a business that is aware of the opportunity that's in front of them. Then you need to help them identify where they actually fit into the supply chain. Uh, Tierra talks about it all the time where it's like, if you are a business that wants to be in here, you need to be able to walk up to a tier one developer or or a tier one supplier and say, I, this is exactly what I do and this is exactly how I'm going to help your business. Uh, a little shameless plug here, the business network, um, we have an education training program called Foundation Blade. It's three days long, but it gives the full breadth of the industry for a business to be able to walk in and walk out of, know exactly where they fit into the supply chain and have a bunch of ideas about where, you know, where and how they can fit in. Uh, finally, it's about scaling. Um, a lot of these businesses that we're targeting, uh, they may not have the capabilities currently of, uh, of being a supplier. Tierra was talking about the certifications that her company had to get, but these are, these are massive civil infrastructure projects that require, uh, serial production requirements. They require, um, um, a through, you know, consistent throughput and just on time, you know, production schedules. And those companies may need help uh, expanding, diversifying, adding lines, adding staff. Um, there are some good examples out there. The state of Maryland has a capital, a, a matching capital program. Uh, in New Jersey, a couple of developers have created a, a, a pool of sorts to, to solve the same problem, which is helping smaller businesses uh, be able to be the suppliers that they know that they can be. Uh, finally, uh, something that North Carolina is already doing, you know, besides uh, besides the outreach that you guys are already doing, besides a, a task force like this, uh, North Carolina set up its own supplier portal uh, uh, as a way to outreach to these companies and at least get their foot in the door and get them on a radar somewhere. Uh, so it's it's you know, anything that state and local government can do to really help with the visibility aspect, with the education aspect, and with the scaling aspect can really, you know, really expand the pool of potential suppliers. Great awareness, visibility, scale. Um, those are the things that, that our experts are telling us. What questions do you guys have about helping businesses uh, uh, be part of the supply chain? Well, one question I thought I would Kevin I would has a, with, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Kevin Dick has a question. R really just, I guess this is posed to the panel and that is your um, respective availabilities to help educate the ecosystem in North Carolina. So, you know, as, as, as task force members, I know there's probably differing levels of, of understanding um, about the industry. But you all are subject matter experts, and so just the ability to maybe invite you all if we wanted to talk to um, businesses at small business centers or, you know, um, or MWBE gatherings and so forth would be really helpful. I mean, I, mean I, I think I think all of us would probably unmute at the same time and say we're evangelists for the industry. <laughs> I mean, professionally, personally. Um, I mean, I think almost all of us were at IPF last week, but I think there's probably nothing more important than than working together to do that kind of outreach and engagement. I think for for the US and for North Carolina to be a successful in offshore wind, like we all do better when we all do better. And I think it's about sharing the news about the outreach, about the opportunity, about the challenges that need to be overcome, especially for small businesses. Um, and so, I mean, I'll put my hand up. Here, here to help, you know, or the business network here to help. Um, I know I think both both the developers on the call, I think are excited to, um, I bet, to be investing in North Carolina. I know Tiara is. Um, and there are also there are colleagues that we work with like across the industry too, depending on what you're looking for in terms of support for education that any of us with one degree of separation could reach out to. And maybe just to jump in from the RWE um, side as well, I had the distinct privilege of introducing Governor Cooper last week at the IPF um, and noted during the uh, introduction that we at RWE are very interested in the opportunity to continue to engage with North Carolina, invest in North Carolina. 
we've had a team that's been on the ground there for about nine months, uh, interacting with different parts of the supply chain, the business community, as well as the education community, um, so that we can get to know the community better and the opportunities to work together. And we'd love to be in a position following the lease auction um, to be able to continue that engagement. We think it's absolutely critical, not only to the success of the industry, um, but also to the way we try to do business uh, here in the U.S. And I, is it, is this on? can you not hear me? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? No. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you, Tara. <laughs> and you, okay, so you all can hear me. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I will actually kind of throw my board hat because I am on the board of the Business Network for Officer Win on real quick. Um, and as, as Sam Slesher was talking about, um, they have Foundation to Bleed. There are also other programs and some free. Um, Offshore Win 101 that, for instance, um, you all can send out to your local, you know, Department of Commerce if people are interested in getting into the offshore wind. And it's just, Sam, help me out here. Is it about an hour or a half, half an hour session? of me talking and half an hour of me answering questions is how, so is how half, an hour, <laughs> half an hour of him talking and it's just a quick intro just to see if businesses are even interested and you know shifting and getting into this industry and if they are then there um there's another program that's just a day um actually i think that's like a half a day and mm -hmm. then you have the foundation to blade that is a three-day program so there are different levels that you know you all can um, look to implement at the state level um in conjunction with the business network for offshore win um to be able to just get the awareness and information out there um again through your different department of commerce uh there's NC State here, there's North Carolina Central here. I mean, you know, even from an education standpoint as well. Great. Well, this is, you know, a real priority uh, is to is to help North Carolina. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Hello. Um, I don't know if you can uh, hear me. Uh, I have a question uh, speaking about smaller businesses and MBEs, minority owned businesses, uh, specifically for the business network. Um, I personally have taken uh, the Foundations to Blade course. I love it. Um, I thought it was really great, uh, and I thought that I knew uh, quite a bit, but I learned even more. Um, and in addition to that, it was very helpful uh, to learn about new businesses or learn about businesses that are pivoting their, their model uh, and supporting offshore wind. Um, but in speaking about these small businesses, is there any opportunity for them to take courses like this, even the offshore wind 101 that Tierra just spoke about for free because they may not have the funds uh, to do so, but specifically not only targeting them, but allowing them to also join the bigger courses that you all have so that they can take advantage of the networking uh, as well. I, I think that will be tremendously uh, helpful to them. And will also absolutely. help the businesses to make those connections and expand. Yeah, absolutely. I'll I'll, I'll be two seconds because I don't want to I want to just make this an advertisement. Um, so so offshore one one hundred one is we do it every Friday. Uh, I can also do it on demand. If you put me in front of a room with a bunch of people, I can I'm happy to do it. It's free, free of cost. Uh, we do with the larger courses. We do partner with states, so we have grants with. States like Maryland, New Jersey, Rhode Island, for example, to to offer it at a reduced cost to to uh, either targeted businesses or businesses at large. So, you know, it's it's something that we would either work with uh, state in uh, North Carolina on or even a local, you know, like I don't know, Wilmington Chamber of Commerce or something like that. You know, we're 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 always happy to to figure out inventive ways to uh, spread the message as, as as effectively as possible. I, I really appreciate that question and and Sam really appreciate you know, your response there. I mean, as a, as a CEO of a small business and, you know, with a vast network of other small businesses and thinking about the upfront costs of breaking into any new industry. I mean, many organizations are very fast to say, oh, here's a mentorship program. Like, let me offer you mentorship, join this, get guidance like small businesses, especially MWB businesses, like we don't need more mentorship. Like like for joining a new industry, you need cash money support to help with the upfront costs. So your question is spot on. And I think especially if there are particular parts of the supply chain that you wanna make sure they have support in entering the industry, 
um, and they, you know, access to things like foundation, foundation to bleed or direct support, like legal support for negotiating contracts when they come, when they win contracts or support for rebranding their materials, things like that. Um, those kinds of grants and direct technical assistance, I think are spot on and the most important and valuable thing that the state could offer. So I would like. Oh, can you read? Okay, mm -hmm. I would actually like to um, just mention to piggyback on that, and I do apologize now to you because I'm stealing like a question that you have um, <laughs> that you're going to answer. But um, because we're on that topic, I will say so. Uh, Sam had mentioned earlier, MEA, we have the Cap grant, CapEx grant, and we have the Workforce Development Grant. Um, just to give you a, a quick example, um, we were Scrum Contracting was awarded the CapEx grant in 2018 from Maryland Energy Administration. And it actually helped us acquire the facility that we needed to grow into where we're at right now in order to be opportunity ready to get into the uh, offshore wind industry. Um, just on Monday, we just received notice that we were awarded the 2022 CapEx grant to help us build out our facility and buy more equipment that not only will allow us to provide fabricated products uh, specific to the offshore wind industry, but will also help us in our current industry as well. Those are examples of how the state of Maryland has provided uh, assistance with grants that small businesses can go after and that can really help supplement their growth. They also have the workforce development grant. So throwing on another board hat for a, a national workforce development uh, organization that I sit on the board of, um, which is JAR. They are a workforce development organization in Baltimore City, as of, as well in Chicago, that they provide welding training and CNC training for welding and training for CNC. Strum Contracting, JARC, JARC was a recipient of the 2018 Workforce Development Grant with MEA. We partnered with that workforce development organization and through an opportunity that we were able to um, have uh, to provide uh, services for the port enhancements at Trade Point Atlantic in Baltimore um, County, which also was a byproduct of Orsted. We were able to create eight new FTEs, full time equivalent positions. We hired Set, we filled seven of those full time equivalent positions with graduates from that workforce development organization. So we were able to come together, partner up with the workforce development that were trying to train for offshore wind, hire those uh, graduates, and then from there, we were able to continue to scale. That's just an example of how small businesses, as well as workforce development, and the state and local government can come together put money out on the street, but then it all be collective for one purpose. And that was to get us ready for the offshore wind industry. So quick story. We probably have time for one more committee question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question, please? Yeah, where would a small business go to find out it what the needs of wind industry are and if they their current business would fit into the wind industry in the future? You, uh, I'm, I'm assuming there's real broad needs for this industry and a lot of businesses may not be aware that they could uh, supply a need to, to the wind industry in the future. Thank you for that question, Lynn. Um, I, I would say, you know, visit our website where the business network for offshore wind. Uh, we talked about a couple of the free education uh, programs that we have as an introduction to your business. But what we always do uh, and preach, uh, you know, especially in whatever the local area it is, is, uh, you know, come to us. We'll offer some education. You know, also talk to Sam Eden with RWE. Uh, also talk to Avangrid. Also talk to the you know, look around who's in your area and uh, they are also, you know, they have a vested interest in building out a local uh, workforce and you've heard from them saying that they really want to. 
Uh, they have a lot of workshops themselves. They have a lot of, uh, um, you would call them contracting fairs or meet the supplier fairs. So there's, you know, it's it's a little bit of uh, poking your head up and, and looking around. And once you do, you'll start seeing things. But, you know, as a first step, feel free to visit us. Feel free to uh, visit the developer websites. And um, it's usually the best first step that you can do. But I would also like to uh, mention we are in the room with a lot of uh, North Carolina state employees. You can use the resources you already have, which is within the state uh, through, I think it's in NC doc. Um, I know Maryland, sorry, it's, it's M dot. Uh, when you're a registered MBE or small business, um, typically, at least I can again, only speak with the Maryland area and Virginia, even Virginia has swam. Um, there's 1 uh, office that sends out information to small minority women owned businesses throughout the state that for the state of Maryland and SWAM in Virginia, they send all their information out um, regarding offshore wind opportunities and, hey, this is this is this is coming and come to a fair, or come to, you know, an information session and those types of things. So they blast it out with their state database. Um, at the state level. So, um, in addition to what Sam said, I will say at the state level, that's one of the things that North Carolina can do is use your, I think, it, like I said, NC dot uh, or the registration. I should know this because we're MBE certified NC company as well. Uh, we have the registration, but you can blast it that way as well. Scott or Sam, anything you guys want to add from a developer perspective? Absolutely, and appreciate the question. I think uh, Sam and, and Tierra uh, just hit it right from the start. Start with the uh, registration with the business network for offshore wind, as well as with the states. Um, those are important places to, to start, and we start looking for opportunities. Um, with the developer connections, we'll put you in touch with our procurement and supply chain teams, um, who, like I said earlier, are committed um, to that strategic outreach to build the supplier database um, so that as we have opportunities, whether they be specific RFPs that are coming out, or specific workshops where you can simply learn about the industry, um, we can then get in touch with you and, and make those connections. Um, I also think it's important where the opportunities exist to um, participate in conferences like the IPF um, or the workshops when they are local as well. Um, I know my team has been down um, working with the Economic Partnership for North Carolina, um, <clears throat> looking at putting some of those workshops together with the Chambers of Commerce, and I think those are great opportunities um, to help make those connections. Yeah, I, I would just echo that. Um, we have our own supply registration portals, um, but going to the conferences, understanding where your specific business might fit in. Uh, it might not be something where we directly contract. It might be a tier one, it might be a tier two, it might be a tier three. Okay. Um, I would also, I know this sounds a bit rich come from me as a, you can hear from my accent, I'm not from the US, but <laughs> look, 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 look to Europe. Uh, they've got an established industry. See, see where you might be able to partner with someone there. Learn from those guys, um, and uh, see where your specific skill set may fit in. Okay, so that's uh, uh, um, and and through Ashley in in uh, in this uh, in this task force, happy happy to spend time and speak to people and, and and you know explain how how things work and where and where you might fit in. We, that's great. Thank you. We want to move on to, to infrastructure and environmental justice, but, but since this is the economic development and business development, um, subcommittees, uh, set of questions. I wonder if you guys, um, have any suggestions for any specific businesses or specific types of businesses, um, that, that we might ought to be talking to in North Carolina to, to, to help, uh, supply the offshore wind. I'm sorry, I'd, can you sort of repeat the question just so I understand it a bit better? Yeah, so just from a business development perspective, um, so we've been talking a lot about existing businesses and what we can do to help our, our existing companies, but are there companies outside of North Carolina um, that we should be talking to now or types of businesses um, that, that would be important parts of the offshore wind supply chain? Okay, sure. Okay, so again, it always goes back to the understanding, uh, understanding the practical aspects of, uh, of uh, uh, developing and building an offshore wind farm. Early stage, which is you know where we're looking at in North Carolina, you're talking about surveying, environmental permitting, that kind of uh, um, aspect, okay? So that's what's gonna be going on over the next few years. To get ahead of the curve, you need to be talking to uh, uh, our tier one contractors, which are turbine suppliers, which are foundation suppliers, um, uh, cable suppliers, um, and within these, within the foundations, 
you can uh, there are certain elements like the transition piece which you can get into a little bit more um, um, into a little bit more detail. So I just need to mute various things popping up on my screen. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a, there's a whole, there's the offshore substation that you talked about, which is actually a, uh, uh, um, you've got main electrical equipment, you've got uh, uh, almost every discipline you can think of in uh, both onshore and offshore. Then you've got the civils works uh, uh, in terms of uh, bringing cables onshore and uh, uh, um, and the trenching works and the uh, and um, and all the onshore elements side of things as well. Um, and then there's all the support activities that you're going to need to support the offshore installation in terms of the marine services, guard vessels, um, etc. Okay, that help at all? Yep, that's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. I think if I could build on that just for just very quickly, I think going back to on the professional services side. I mean, there's many things that, you know, you'll need to do and that developers will need to do and, um, you know, also on community outreach and engagement on thinking about local content and community economic development, like that needs a really long runway. So I think, I mean, not a sales pitch for my firm, but I think for an organization like mine, I think should be engaged early. I think there's probably an exercise that North Carolina, you know, the state or this task force can do and really mapping out you know, the life cycle of an offshore wind project and then thinking about kind of what skill sets or what, what core skill sets are needed, both on the professional services side and on, you know, technical environmental permitting and then everything through design, construction, operations and maintenance and decommissioning and mapping that through across the supply chain. If I'm not mistaken, I think North Carolina had already commissioned a supply chain study. So I think that study can also be very useful in this overall mapping exercise. And then I think try the earlier parts of our conversation, then it's thinking about, you know, what does North Carolina already have in state and then thinking at where the gaps are and then specifically to your question, then then you can think about what do you need to reach out out of state for right to think about then what do you want to bring in to learn from that expertise? Is there anything from Massachusetts or New York, New Jersey that it makes sense to bring in because they've gone through it a little bit, you know, a little bit before North Carolina, maybe you want to bring them in just to add some capacity. You know, to train folks locally, maybe you want to bring them in because you don't want to develop it locally for whatever reason. Um, but I think that exercise could be very useful in helping step sequence some of this. Um, because I think there's like similar questions we keep coming back to, but I think that might give the task force a sense of comfort and a sense of knowledge base, you know, that you can take strength from and moving forward. And I, I would like to add to that. Um, I mean, the great thing that North Carolina has, um, and we were at a session last week, North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland all have the MOU. Um, and that is great because now you can go to your neighboring state to see, you know, maybe of the um, uh, reports and, and different things that they've done and, and where they've identified gaps. I will also say um, we need tradesmen. We need them back. We need electricians. We need plumbers. We definitely need welders. Um, really start to think about how do we develop the technical skill sets that we need for the future for these types of projects. So I would like to throw that in. Great, very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, let's let's move on to, to infrastructure and, and environmental justice. Um, Scott, interested in, in your opinion um, about, uh, we talked, Brian talked a little bit about Radio Island, and, um, and we know uh, that that is an asset that we have in the state uh, at the Port of Moorhead City. Um, and just curious uh, what your opinion is or any of the other panelists' opinion is of kind of the optimal use of that 150 acres. Is it um, something that, uh, is it a near-term opportunity, like a, a lay down an assembly? Is it a more long-term opportunity? for manufacturing components or some combination of that. Um, so just curious about your uh, assessment of that asset. Okay, um, I'll give you the short answer, then I'll elaborate. So both is the honest answer, okay? Um, I, think, I think you're all aware that, you know, offshore wind requires significant ports and infrastructure, okay, to be developed. It needs ports with what they call high load bearing capacity because we've got to support very large, very large structures. It needs uh, well-maintained deep water uh, waterways and, um, and berths wherever possible. It needs, it needs to have no restrictions on the air draft, the height. Um, and we need access to, to large areas of laydown uh, for components and supporting offices and functions like that. Uh, so that's part of it. That's the kind of the water side and the, uh, um, and, the, uh, and the port. We also need to understand 
um, uh, the land access, okay? Because there's these supersized loads will be delivered by by both rail and road, okay? Um, then we talk about the supply chain. Ideally, uh, we need to understand uh, what the support what the supporting services are there uh, within the area. Um, and as I said, I think there's many opportunities for that particular location, both in terms of major suppliers locating themselves there, but also uh, uh, developers because they do need similar similar uh, uh, types of infrastructure in terms of the uh, the pier, the key, and the uh, um, and the and the land. And we talked about it previously. I think you know you should be trying to organise yourselves to uh, um, create opportunities for both federal and and uh, state grants or loans to do that. Um, I think you know when do we need to start doing it now is when we need to start the uh, uh, um, start the effort, start the engineering, starting the work on on, on getting this uh, um, this uh, location ready. That's helpful, and and maybe Sam Eaton, you could also kind of chime in in terms of of your thoughts about pre development activities that we ought to be thinking about now, um, and and what what that ought to look like, or what that might include at, at a at a site like Radio Island. I think Scott hit on many of those. Um, you know, it really starts with an assessment of the facility. I know that's work that's already been started by the ports uh, agency down there in North Carolina. And uh, we've been uh, integrated with that and working on uh, looking at some of the work um, through the tours that we've done <clears throat> with it. You know, it is critical that we find these facilities where we can um, uh, marshal all of the equipment that we are going to bring out as part of a um, an offshore wind project. Um, these are very large scale projects. It always surprises folks um, just how much air draft we need. Um, you know, the example I would use here in the Northeast, uh, many folks thought about um, uh, the port of uh, Providence and Narragansett being opportunities um, because the bridge was originally built to be able to accommodate a Nimitz class aircraft carrier being able to go under it. Um, we had the unfortunate chore of being able to share with them that uh, our facility requirements were actually larger than that. Um, because the components are that much uh, larger. Um, so I think a lot of that early assessment work uh, needs to be completed. And then with that, you come up with a plan of what the investment's going to look like. And you start to think about what is the structure that can work with the industry and the developers um, to be able to execute on that plan. In the Northeast, a lot of times that's taken the, uh, the shape of a public partnership um, with the developers that takes time um, to get in place and negotiate contracts. To bring in the right contractors to get the work underway and completed in order to then support the construction schedules. Uh, Sam Salustro, based on on your activities in other states, and Rebecca, curious about, um, and this is kind of a broad question, but but uh, any thoughts that you might have about um, how infrastructure investments and uh, environmental justice can can work together and and may may be able to actually enhance environmental justice through different infrastructure investments. Rebecca, you may be best to yeah. first answer this. <laughs> sure. I mean, and, and I come to this, um, you know, I actually used to work at the ports in New York and New Jersey and operations, and I've worked at community organizations and um, I'm deep in this world. So the answer is yes, like investments can certainly, infrastructure investments can certainly benefit environmental justice communities, but as with many, as with big projects like this anywhere, like I, I advise um, moving slowly and thoughtfully um, and really doing your homework about what communities you're working within. So within offshore wind, um, if you're, and forgive me if I'm treading territory that you already know well, but I think it's worth taking a moment to do so. You know, within the environmental justice community and advocacy community, you know, folks are really talking about the transition to offshore wind through the lens of a just transition. And so when we talk about a just transition within the energy economy, what we're really talking about is preparing local communities for the jobs, for the economic development, for the opportunity that clean energy like offshore wind will bring, you know, really ensuring that those benefits flow to local residents in economic, or excuse me, in environmental justice communities. And then again, we're really centering development on the needs of those communities, you know, and understanding that environmental justice communities have often been on like the horrible, nasty receiving end of noxious uses, um, like where there have been like, say, like peaker plants have been located there or asphalt plants. And in these communities, they typically have lower expectancy of life and like terrible, you know, health outcomes and things of this nature. So 
within that context of really thinking about a just transition, benefits for local communities, greater access to MWBEs, um, and really centering you know, local residents, we can think about infrastructure investments, but it has to be starting with community. It has to mean like if we think about a seat at the proverbial table, it has to be thinking about like regenerative actions rather than extractive actions. It has to mean starting with community, understanding their priorities, uh, making sure that they're informing decisions, that things are being done with people, not to people. This means meeting early and often having iterative and deliberative and collaborative conversations and it means moving at the speed of trust which is often not as fast as we we might want to go right like i think we all know that offshore wind projects like already take a very long time so then thinking about what does it mean to have a you know a collaborative iterative process that can be a little scary if we're talking about putting that in and and slowing down for a minute I would argue that that's really important because, you know, if we think about regulatory processes, we think about lawsuits. I would argue that really engaging with environmental justice communities and leaders is a way to de-risk your project and make it stronger on the other side. So I think it's about collaboration. It's about partnership. It's about understanding what's happening. It's about showing up with humility. And yes, I think investments can be a way toward making projects stronger and toward investing in communities. Um, but it, it's a it's a long it's a long road. I think it's the right one to take. It's the only way these projects will be successful. But it's 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 a long road. I could talk about this all day, so I I will pause <laughs> and can always answer more specific questions. Like like Sam, what are you thinking from the business network? Like you're working all over on this too. Um, we we I was going to talk about uh, a couple I would say developments that we're seeing across the industry, which. We're seeing a lot more intentionality of 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 creating as much uh, zero emission spaces as possible, and that's adding new technology into the ports themselves. Uh, zero emission vehicles, you know, you you aren't totally aware of of the massive amount of of emissions that still happen at a port facility, but it's there's a bunch of trucks going around, there's a bunch of cranes, etc. So it's it's adding that new technology. Uh, a lot of the vessels themselves uh a lot of developers and shipbuilders here when we're talking about building offshore wind uh, vessels a lot of those vessels are either no emission ve vessels or hybrid vessels of some sort uh so on the technology front and we're seeing it's it's really coming out of of europe so a lot of these developers are probably already experienced uh retrofitting their ports or retrofitting their facilities to do this we're also seeing it uh, on the West Coast and in New York too, where uh, there's a very conscious effort to to uh, deliver economic economic deliver economic development. That's a kind of a double word. Deliver economic development with this long term um, environmental standards in place. Uh, and uh, we're also, you know, it, it is being um, it is much more part of the conversation up in northeastern ports to have this very deliberate conversation that Rebecca was talking about too. Um, I, for, I forgot one really important thing um, that, that I would be remiss if I didn't say it. So like in New York and in New Jersey, like there's legislation like that mandates inclusion of environmental justice communities and environmental justice organizations like partnered you know, with government to draft and now enforce that legislation. So in New York, it's the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that has this requirement of greenhouse emissions, like that requires a lot of the actions that Sam is talking about. Um, but it also then ties back like 35% of total statewide spending on clean and energy efficiency programs have to go back toward environmental justice communities and disadvantaged communities. New Jersey has a similar law. So I think the trend that I'm seeing, at least in the Northeast, and we're hearing conversations like this sprouting up around the United States, is for actually like to be legislating, you know, toward how investments will then be like truly benefiting communities in this way. What what questions do the committee members have? Is this on? Yep. Can we get uh, the mic for Greg and Dak uh, turned up, please? That's, that's, I, that's 
Hi, Greg Anduk with the uh, Audubon Society. Thanks so much for the really good remarks and um, especially appreciated, you know, Rebecca's comments about really de-risking, especially in the EJ context. You know, we think a lot about just how regulated this industry is and the multiple layers at the federal and state level that industry has to go through <laughs> to really deliver on these projects. Um, and in the same way that we think about, you know, infrastructure investments and things we might need to do at the state level to upgrade our ports, upgrade tr transmission capacity to make sure that we're well positioned to attract this industry and, and deliver on these projects, you know, what are the types of things we need to be thinking about to de-risk the regulatory process? Um, you know, what is, first of all, is there a real cost to delays in projects coming to fruition because they get bogged down for whatever reason in the regulatory process or through litigation? Obviously, you know, I'm more familiar in the context of wildlife and environmental potential conflicts, but are there things that the state can be doing to support industry in de-risking that space um, venues or forums that states create to bring stakeholders together? What are some best practices that we should be thinking about to really avoid situations where you have projects get bogged down for whatever reason? Yeah, that's a, it's a fabulous question. Um, and I can talk to things that I've seen NYSERDA do in New York State. And then um, I think that um, Sam and Scott, from a developer's perspective, um, will likely have some some great Great things to share here. So things that I've seen nicer to do at the state level um, that I think have been extraordinary in this regard are um, are really working in collaboration with both environmental and and, and like environmental like ENGOs as well as environmental justice leaders um, toward doing industry outreach and engagement like early and often and like separate from specific development project, like specific projects so that they're just in regular conversation all the time. There are environmental justice leaders in the New York region who will not reference any other agency or any specific developer, but they will mention NYSERDA by name and talk about the partnership and the transparency and like the trust that they have with NYSERDA because NYSERDA just shows up and NYSERDA does exactly what it says it will do. NYSERDA has issued um, you know, guiding principles for stakeholder engagement you know, for offshore wind developers, they retained my company to help write those. And we were, um, we suggested and NYSERDA requested and demanded that we consult with environmental justice leaders toward what that would look like, right? NYSERDA took leadership and asked my team to put together, um, you know, curriculum for teenagers about what offshore wind could be. And we worked with NYSERDA to engage with environmental justice and ENGO leaders around the state toward what their priorities would be in curriculum for youth. So there are all of these things outside of the regulatory process that NYSERDA does and has done and continues to do to engage with community leaders, to really partner with them, to show up for them, to give back, to hear their concerns, to engage them in the process outside of the regulatory process that brings temperatures down, right? That hears their ideas and hears their concerns and addresses them. Like during the regulatory process, like when we get into Article 7, you know, and there's like the required meetings. I mean, I think it's a similar principle, I would argue, as, as for like any big process for like NEPA for other projects, right? Or, you know, state and federal processes. It's like, I would say it's about like transparency. It's about following through. It's about commitment. It's about, you know, are you having pre meetings as well as like the big required meetings? Um, you know, so I think it's about all those really good principles of outreach and engagement that you probably already know and carrying those through because it just takes one organization like bringing a lawsuit. Yeah, to cost to cost millions of dollars and slowing things down. Um, so that's my kind of general perspective on it. I'm curious, Sam and Scott, we know how this has played out for you. To kind of jump in. I think it's absolutely critical that we understand that, yes, Delays in the permitting process and delays in the construction process have cost 
um, associated with them. But there's also the, the more important piece of it, which is it's just the right way to do business by engaging with the local communities. And I have had the, the fortunate experience of working for a large number of different developers throughout my career, um, including folks in, in the Northeast on the New York projects, as well as in New England. And, you know, the gold standard is what NYSERDA did. They did a fantastic job early, very early on setting up working groups around each of the very um, specific types of stakeholders that you can expect to be involved in an offshore wind project, whether that be fisheries, the environmental NGOs, um, the workforce organizations, the community organizations. And with that, they started just as Rebecca said, it was very early uh, engagements with them as the industry was started um, to talk about what their concerns were, but also to inform them on what was fact versus fiction. Because oftentimes when there isn't engagement, there isn't good communication, fiction very quickly gets into the communities and spread in a way that uh, doesn't support good, um, healthy dialogues between the developers and the community members. Um, with that, then also, once they had specific projects, it became a requirement for the developers to engage with those working groups. And that was a, you know, it was a forced conversation to ensure that it was happening. But we found as developers that it was incredibly useful um, for us at the very end of the, or excuse me, the very beginning of the projects to be able to have those dialogues. Because what you find in these projects is often many of the concerns that come up can be addressed early in the design process. But if you're already two, three, four, five, six years into a 10 year project, uh, many of those things that may need to be adjusted are already getting locked in and there's substantial tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars worth of costs that then come into play. And it becomes a much harder conversation to adapt a project to that feedback. So uh, our, at RWE, as an, a company, as well as myself leading the America's business unit, we are very committed to getting that early, often dialogue going so that we can. Uh, bringing that process in to the early design of a project. That's great. Um, any other infrastructure? Yes, go ahead. It's a question about that Greg had um, piggyback on that. Who should be the lead to create these working groups or um, outreach groups to work on environmental permitting and regulations? I'm not sure if they heard the question, Daniel. Can you bring the microphone closer? Just to piggyback on what Greg asked, who should be the lead um, to create these working groups? environmental permitting. Well, I can maybe jump in. I think that's a little bit of something that could be an outgrowth of the NC Towers um, Task Force with a recommendation um, as to where those go. Um, there's probably a number of different agencies within North Carolina, DEP for one, the PUC that could be part of those um, organizations. And I'm sure there's others that I'm just not as familiar with um, or that um, may have an interest in it. But I think it is critical that you think about as a state um, setting those up early so that we can make sure we get that feedback built into the process. Yeah, to totally agree. And I think it would be very helpful if the the agency or organization that facilitates that, I would recommend be the one who's one of the agencies or the agency that is going to be managing your procurement process. Because I think you're going to want to have the, the feedback and all the information that's been collected and captured during those working groups will be informing your procurement, you know, design and delivery process. And we do have an outreach and engagement subcommittee, which is working on that very thing. Yeah, so we'll come back to, to some of these topics. I think when we, when we move to those questions, let's, uh, let's spend a little bit of time about workforce and education and training. Um, Scott, uh, maybe you could share with us some of your, some experiences that Avangrid has had regarding workforce. Or, are you guys having trouble finding skilled workers? Are you aware of successful programs that are generating the kind of talent that you need? What, what are you experiencing? Um, thanks very much for the question. It's a big question, okay? And it's, and, you know, it's one of the key, the key areas for us uh, uh, here in the US and, and, and globally. So I think we talked about the project, the project life cycles, um, and the skills vary at different phases and they're very long as well, okay? So you've got in the development stage, we're talking about environmental permitting backgrounds. And then as we move through, we, we talk about engineering, procurement, contracts, construction, and then uh, um, you know, that's when we get into execution. And then we'll eventually end up in operations where we, where we need multi-skilled uh, wind turbine technicians, okay? Um, there's not really an equivalent, well, there is an equivalent onshore, but, but in terms of, you know, they're not, they're not just an electrician, they're a mechanical engineer, they're a very multi-skilled uh, um, individual. As part of Eva Drolla, uh, which is uh, uh, um, one of the parent companies of um, Avangrid, we've been through this cycle a number of times around the globe. 
Uh, so we're actually starting from a good place, okay? We are able to share our knowledge, uh, our experience and our skills through our global team members, you know, which is why I'm here supporting our team over here. And then we recruit locally and we transfer that knowledge and we grow the, uh, you know, we grow our businesses locally. What I would say is that obviously you're talking to me as a developer here, but a lot of the job, in fact, most of the jobs are created by our, our tier one, our tier two and our tier three suppliers. Okay. Um, they are the key employers. So they're the, they're the people that we need to get in front of. We recognize this and we work with those as soon as we can um, to make sure that we put them in front of the right people in the local area. And we also establish training programs so they get what they need. Okay. We believe there's a lot of opportunity in North Carolina. Uh, we talked about transferable skills, uh, you know, the number of uh, training programs, uh, et cetera. Um, so we're already doing this, by the way. This isn't just a, like a, a new thing. We're doing this in the Northeast with our portfolio. We, you know, we've got 2.8 gigawatts in the Northeast there as well. Uh, I think we've already talked about meet the buyer uh, um, uh, uh, sessions as well, where we facilitate conversations between tier two, tier three, and our tier one um, suppliers as well. So that's, so that's how we go about it. It isn't easy. There isn't a perfect answer to it. Um, here in the US, the offshore wind industry is uh, are growing. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's imperative that we train and we grow homegrown talent as well. Sam Eaton, I, I know you guys maybe have some apprenticeship programs or some specific um, recruitment programs focused on military, former military employees. Wonder if you could maybe share some information about those. Yeah, happy to, and maybe to kind of take a step back and look at it from a global perspective. I think you hit it. I mean, it is a global challenge that we all have in the renewables industry and in, in putting together the workforce that's going to be um, supporting uh, the energy transition. Um, we see that in Europe, we see it in Asia Pacific, we see it here in the US. But with that, it's an opportunity. Um, and we've got some specific examples of what we've done in Europe, for example, um, in the Humber region of the, um, the UK, we're a member, one of the founding members of the Humber Offshore Wind Supply Chain Cluster, um, which is a collaboration of various developers and the regional supply chain, the public sector, as well as the educational institutions to increase productivity, competitiveness, innovation um, in the offshore wind sector. And with that, you've really seen that region transform itself. Um, it was a fairly sleepy, in some ways, um, not economically uh, robust fishing community um, back in the 80s and 90s. And you go there today, and it's really amazing to see the transformation that's uh, taken place, not only uh, in terms of the investment in manufacturing facilities and the operations and maintenance facilities, but also the workforce development institutions that we've built as an industry there. Um, we also support the Offshore Wind Industry Council supply chain work stream as part of the UK government um, to help build the, the workforce that we're looking for. Um, in the US, um, a little more specific, we've been in the US for about 15 years, specifically focused on the onshore wind, solar, and storage business. We've established our own wind technician training facilities, um, including our, our hub facility in Texas. We'll be doing the same thing in the offshore wind space as we're building our portfolio. We did just uh, win a three gigawatt um, project uh, or opportunity off the coast of New York, and that'll be kind of the crux of where we put some of those opportunities. But we also will be building on our programs um, both in Europe, particularly the UK, as well as here in the US to recruit military veterans into the organization. We often find um, their skills, particularly around project management, technical troubleshooting, um, as well as fabrication can be quite helpful and very transferable into the offshore wind industry. Um, so we prioritize those in our recruiting um, efforts um, and would look forward to, if we've given the opportunity in North Carolina um, to help bring that uh, program that we have uh, down in Texas and Florida um, into North Carolina as well. Great, Tierra. Uh, thinking about your business, um, what specific training programs have you put in place? You mentioned the, the workforce partnership that you had um, that you were hiring some folks from, but what's been your most reliable source of, of talent over the years? Um, so we recruit from three different areas, uh, the local community colleges uh, that have the welding um, certificates and programs, uh, the technical um, trade schools, as well as workforce development um, organizations uh, that we recruit uh, collectively from. And then um, when we bring them into Strum Contractor, we do what is typically like an encumber worker training. So where we're mixing, you know, our new um, employees with our seasoned employees and we match them together and they work under like a mentee mentor 
type of um, relationship within our company to try to get them up to speed on the work that we do. Uh, the current work that we do, um, it's, uh, I'll say, non-traditional. We typically hang off of bridges. So um, that that's a bit of a of a skill set that is is definitely unique. Um, so with that being said, um, a lot of times dealing with um, different types of populations that you're dealing with, um, they may be you know height issues or confined space issues and those types of things. So really trying to um, get the workforce uh, because it's very diverse um, on board um, and bringing in firms to like I said do and we're encumber worker training to bring everybody up to speed. So those are some of the things. That's great. Sam Sluster, what 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 are you seeing uh, with uh, in terms of programs across across your organization that are unique or or innovative as it relates to to workforce? Yeah, I was going to talk about how the how the state can really have an intentional role in, in this conversation right now. Uh, what we do see in other states, Tara touched on it before, but the state of Maryland does have a workforce training grant and it's for organizations to scale up their workforce training. Um, uh, uh, program. So through that program, uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland has a GWO training center, a welding center, and I believe that they're standing up some sort of um, a wind technician center over there too. Uh, but in a lot of, in the states that maybe a couple of years ahead of where North Carolina is, there was a lot of deliberate actions that were taken. It starts with doing, you know, and excuse me if this is already going on, or this is already part of NC Towers uh, uh, task force. You know they do some sort of report that really outlines uh, what the expected needs are, and what the what the sort of uh, grand scale uh, or the aggregate sort of skill set is available within the state. Start really identifying where obvious holes are. You know you're going to hear over and over and over again. It's welding. It's welding. It's welding. Uh, and then they start setting up programs to to uh, laser focus in on that. So, um, state of New Jersey for you know I talked about Maryland a little bit. State of New Jersey, for example, um, or state of New York went through this process, and they came up with uh, pooling together about twenty million dollars uh, and targeting it at four different schools within New York that are you know targeting subsects of, of subsections of these. Uh, Virginia, just to the north of you, they have the Mid Atlantic Training Training Alliance right now. It's uh, three different schools that are are working together to sort of offer a full scope of of the training that's necessary. Uh, I'll do a little plug here for uh, there are uh, within um, within Rebecca's world. There's a great need too. Um, the the weirdest thing coming out of uh, our IPF session was the amount of engineering companies that I'm talking to that are talking about hiring, you know, a person a week or two people a week. And there's just such a demand for uh, engineers with maritime experience, civil and maritime experience. So it's 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 very broad. Uh, it takes a little bit. It And this is where the state can st uh, step in and have a very uh, intentional role that they can play and like what tiara was saying you know tiara and rebecca they're going to be the ones that are hiring them so it's also connecting with them and figuring out uh how they recruit people uh where they recruit people from and where some of those gaps are that they're already seeing as they're trying to break into this industry what questions do our committee members have for this panel about workforce education Steve. Fast. Just a quick one, a quick follow up to Sam, what you were just saying uh, about engineers. Uh, do you know what disciplines within engineering are kind of at the premium right now? No, um, I hate to say when, as soon as I start talking to engineers, I, I they, their, their knowledge is way beyond mine. So all I hear is civil. Sam or Scott, maybe I would assume civil, but. Mechanical, electrical, others. Uh, I, maybe yeah. Rebecca can comment too. Yeah, yeah. Would you would you like me to have Scott, a go? go? Yeah, Scott, yeah. go yeah. for it. Okay, so we, we we need a lot of different a, a lot of different disciplines, and don't let the offshore element skew it. Okay, the, the, it is it's uh, it's everything. So you need structural engineers. We're going to need electrical engineers. We're going to need a, a SCADA or or, or a, a control system engineers. Um, 
we're going to turb they're going to call them turbine engineers but they come from an electrical or a mechanical background okay um civil engineers these are offshore wind projects but they've got an awful lot of onshore scope as well okay we've talked about ports and infrastructure you know, hydrographic engineers uh, we we have a uh, uh, site characteristics people who understand all the, all the wind movements we have met ocean engineers you know people who look after all, all the uh, all the oceanographic uh, uh, side of things geotechnical geophysical engineers who under now the who understand the substrate and the uh, um, and the ground conditions so there's almost you, know, you you if you think of it we'll be using it somewhere okay that that would be my uh, my thoughts on that rebecca yeah i mean 100% to what you're saying, Scott, about the specific disciplines, but I also want to just offer perspective, both as a small business owner and as someone working in the industry. So I think there's this image in the public consciousness when we think of offshore wind jobs that you're either like on the water or you're behind a desk, right? So you're like the engineer or you're actually out there, you know, like on a vessel doing that kind of work. And like, yes, there's going to be lots and lots of those kinds of jobs. But a lot of the demand that I'm also seeing from the organizations that we work with are for project developers. So doing a lot of like, like finance or administrative assistance or, you know, actually putting the responses together when you're bidding on projects with the state, like research, all of those kinds of things. I'm seeing a lot of demand for consultants, again, at all stages of project development, community organizations like outreach specialists. Um, and, uh, you know, increase like job demand at community organizations and environmental justice organizations that are also doing work in renewable energy, you know, like jobs at state and city agencies that are doing work in offshore wind. Now, I mean, the jobs are everywhere. It's not just at developers. Um, and I mean, so I would say like using CARP strategies as an example. Like we lost almost all of our projects at the beginning of the recession, March 2020. It was like, are we going to close our company? When we pivot into doing more work in offshore wind, we start to grow again. We were 15 people in September 2021. Today we're 32 people. We're going to be 40 to 45 people by the end of the summer. All, every single new hire we have is because of our work in offshore wind. And the work, the people that I'm hiring for are community engagement specialists, they're strategy people, they're writers, they do finance, and they're coming, so they're not technical experts. And when I think of things then for that job growth that like the state can do, there's a couple of things. So yes to like financing for that growth and like kind of the programs we've been talking about. We received a grant from New York City to do customized training internally. So we take our team through like an offshore wind boot camp. And the state pays us for, or not the state, the city pays us for the time we do internally around that because we take our team through that boot camp and they pay us for, for that time and it's allowed us to grow internally. NYSERDA also runs this incredible series. It's on Wednesday afternoons at one o'clock. It's called Learn from the Experts. And they have these webinars where they bring in people across all different segments of the industry from people who are marine biologists to engagement specialists to different developers you name it, and it's purely informational. Of anybody who wants to go can sign up to learn about the industry. So there are things like that too that can like really help, I think, pour gas on the fire. You know, when we're thinking about workforce development, when we're thinking about pushing out, you know, pushing the word out there. Um, and as we're thinking about growth, really like yes, yes, engineering, yes, manufacturing, but also yes, like all of the interstitial, you know, jobs in between. And we think about how you want to capture that in North Carolina. Other workforce questions. I know we have a couple of industry representatives on the task force. If uh, you want to weigh in, I know Scott McIntyre, Arkita just stepped out, but um, Hayes Fromming is also on virtually. Hayes, if you want to add to the conversation, please feel free to unmute. Thanks. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, great. I, and nothing, nothing really substantive to add. Uh, all, all the perspectives here capture kind of the breadth and depth of how the industry is thinking about workforce development and, and a lot of the opportunities and, and the needs uh, that the that the industry sees. So, we'll just echo everything that's been set up to this point. Thank you, Hayes. Well, our last uh, section is related to outreach and engagement. So, uh, so we've been talking about that a little bit as we've, we've gone along. Um, but um, um, 
I know Rebecca has done a, obviously a lot of work in this area, so I think we, we want to hear about maybe what what you what you're doing in in New York um, to start with, um, and maybe tell us a little bit about um, uh, how that might be relevant to what we're thinking about doing in North Carolina. Sure. So in New York, we're doing a couple of things. Um, we have been working with NYSERDA for several years and helping them define and support their outreach and engagement programming. So from helping them define their, you know, their guiding principles for developers for what's expected for developers for stakeholder engagement to, you know, to developing, you know, the offshore wind youth action program for teenagers that I spoke about earlier. Um, so I think there's there's the supporting the, the state agency toward what their engagement goals and ideas are. Um, we are just about we just began work with New York City, their economic development corporation. We're putting together an offshore wind. Um, like training outreach and awareness programs specifically targeting MWBEs. So back, back to that question of like how do we how do we let people know about the industry and when you have transferable skills, um, we're going to be quarterbacking that program for the city. Um, and we have the privilege of supporting Equinor and their Empire One and Two and Beacon Wind projects. Um, and we're we're supporting Equinor through developing their outreach and engagement strategy, as well as helping them think about how they deliver on the millions and millions of dollars of community economic um, benefits that they've committed to communities. So across all of this work, when we think about outreach and engagement and what I would encourage um, anybody in any state to think about is like first understanding, like, you know, what is the project that you're delivering? Assessing who are the stakeholder groups, and I tend to think of them in like big buckets, you know, whether that be like environmental groups, you know, envir um, environmental justice groups, educators, government, elected officials, you know, do that stakeholder mapping to understand who, who knows about offshore wind, who doesn't, who will benefit, who might get hurt from the project. Um, and then thinking about how you're going to find those people through outreach, meeting people where they are, what types of engagement you know, techniques or tactics you might use. Um, and then again, early, early and often follow up throughout. So, um, so for us, this is looking like a combination of lots of virtual engagement because of COVID, as well as, you know, when we can like safe in-person engagement from creative workshops to one-on-one -on -one briefings, you know, to tours at port facilities when we can do it to like lots of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Like literally I drink so much coffee. I don't know how my stomach is still in, Good condition, but really meeting people one on one, answering questions and and providing good information and countering misinformation. Um, so full on ground game capacity building within developers, capacity building with the state um, and having a really comprehensive strategy for it. Sam Salister, anything that you would add in terms of other effective strategies that you've seen employed? Uh, I, I want to, uh, I know Jamie's in the room and uh, Southeast Wind Coalition does do a lot of this stuff on the ground right now. Um, mo you know, a lot of, a lot of, you know, you talk about engaging communities and working with local communities. One of the biggest concerns is always going to be uh, on impact of the local community. I know Southeast Wind Coalition has done a tremendous job on the education piece down there and it is a ton of one-on-one -on -one conversations with local stakeholders. I know that they held um, um, a town hall with uh, feasibility studies of what uh, the Wilmington East area might look like. Uh, it's in it. It's hard work. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of emotions and you're dealing with a lot of feelings, and it it takes a lot of intentionality. And there, um, we would be remiss to not uh, uh, single them out for a lot of the work that they've been doing before the industry has really shown up here. And I know the state is doing a lot themselves too. So it's it's when when we see this done well elsewhere, uh, again, New York is probably one of the best that does it. It's a combined effort between uh, private, public, and engaging either nonprofits leading the way or engaging nonprofit or nonprofits, you know, the local local community groups to to really uh, help be the messengers down there. Great, great point. Thanks, for, thanks for bringing that out. Um, and and for for Scott and, and Sam Eaton, you know, we 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 have talked a lot about government or or nonprofits, you know, leading those outreach and engagement efforts. Um, but what do you think the role is that businesses might play 
in, in, in helping with that outreach and, and how can businesses be encouraged to play it? I can jump in and, you know, having led many of those efforts up in New York for a couple of projects that are under development currently, um, I think it's important for the state to take a leading role when the industry is getting started. But as you transition into a situation where there's specific projects that are on the table, it's incumbent on the utility to, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the developer to really take on the engagement itself. Um, and with that, you have to be able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. You have to be in the community. Um, you have to bring people um, into project locations and meet people where they are um, to understand their circumstances. And as Rebecca said earlier, you have to build that sense of trust um, to be able to have those kinds of conversations. Um, with that, then it becomes kind of a groundswell and a foundation that you can build on. But it is often early communication that continues to go forward and you almost have to over communicate. Um, at least from the developer's perspective, you think you're telling people things that should be um, second nature or already well known. But the reality is you're, you're working with people that have millions of things on their minds in any given day. Um, and what you're doing is not the only thing that they're worried about. And so you need to be spending the time um, to make sure that they have that accurate information um, whenever it comes up. That includes getting in front of your activities in the local community. Um, one of the things I saw firsthand go foul in New York in a number of situations is being able to tell the community in advance what you're expecting to do and when. Um, it's very a very simple fundamental thing, but to be able to just say, hey, look, we are going to be out in the community doing surveys for the following two weeks. Expect to see the next these five traits or five characteristics going on um, in your community. That cuts down on the number of uh, calls that come in. It cuts down on the miscommunications and the mistrust about who these individuals are and what they're doing in the community. Scott, anything to add? Uh, all I'd add is, I think, just to echo a lot of what's been said here is, is, is understand who you're dealing with. It isn't one size fits all. They're all going to have their own wants and needs, understanding. And as Sam said, they've all got their own day to day lives to lead. Okay. So it's really about spending time and effort explaining the why. And you have to keep going back as to why we're doing what we're doing. And then what, what, what are we going to be doing? And then how are we going to be doing it? Um, it's listening and adjusting and not just carrying on straight as you were going to, you know, you need to, we have an idea, we have to plan, we have to engineer and, and move forward with something, but we need to be sensitive to, uh, uh, to what's happening. So we need to adjust. And then it's very simple is that again, this is the same in every, in, in every day life is just do what you say you're going to do. And if you say you're going to do it, do it to the best of your abilities, keep talking to people. Um, and that's, uh, uh, you know, treat them as people. And, and that's, uh, I think is, uh, uh, what I'd, what I'd add to that. Any outreach and engagement questions from the members of the committee. And Jamie, feel free to come in if you want to jump in. Tess, can you hear me? Thank you. Marquita. Uh, Thanks for the shout out, Sam. And thank you all for um, for sharing your expertise um, with us. You can't see me, I'm Jamie Simmons with the Southeastern Wind Coalition. Um, I actually have a question for you all. It's kind of outreach, kind of just general. Um, you know, we've mentioned a couple of times that North Carolina is um, kind of like the, the second wave, if you will, of, of offshore wind. And I'm, I'm curious, if you have any thoughts on how we could use that to our strategic advantage, Sam Eaton, I'm, I'm, um, I really appreciate your comment about New York because I'm, I'm, my specific question really is uh, any lessons learned from from this this first wave um, development. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, that is the key point that uh, you can benefit from as being the first part of the second wave is those lessons learned. Um, we've all made mistakes. Um, things didn't always go perfectly according to plan in those first projects. And you know, Scott, myself, others that have been involved in the industry um, can then take those into the next set of projects to be able to do it better. 
Um, one of the ones we talked about, I think there are some opportunities around our outreach and engagement that we saw, you know, four, five, six, seven years ago early on in the project life cycles that didn't go the way it should have. Um, that creates opportunity. I think we've also saw uh, with that some uh, opportunities to more strategically plan how we bring the workforce along, how we bring the supply chain along. Um, and that's things that Rebecca and her team have really been working with and Sam on the business network have been working with NYSERDA and others. Um, to help uh, better structure and formulate those ideas as we go into the next phase of procurements and next phase of projects around the country. Yeah, I, I would add to that, Jamie, um, love this question. I think one of the key lessons learned um, is, you know, these projects take a long time and it, it's a little bit of that chicken and the egg of, you know, we need to train people up and then when will the jobs be ready? We need to get the, we need to have different parts of the supply chain, like ready to go and when will the contracts be delivered. Right? And so that's tough and I think. You know, following the industry before my company got very actively involved in it, it was, it was just very interesting to see like when messages were being pushed out about opportunities being there. That didn't manifest then for a couple of years. So like, yeah, lesson learned, right? Like it's, I think it's really important to communicate like things are coming. We're not quite sure when, but this is this is this is the timing. As soon as we know more, we will tell you, <laughs> right? And so, I, so I think that's one of the biggest things is like being comfortable communicating about the unknown, for sure, and continuing to like collaborate with community. As a second, the third is something we continue to see on the ground in New York, New Jersey, and in New England is. Um, uh, local, like, you know, like my mom, local people, people in a neighborhood who aren't plugged in, it's very difficult for them to distinguish between developers, right? It's just all offshore wind. So, uh, you know, and in North Carolina, you can think about like, what does that mean then? How are we doing outreach and engagement as an industry versus different developers? So I think there's lessons learned there. Um, sorry, Tara, you were jumping in and I kept talking, apologies. No, 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 um, exactly what you were saying 1, it's setting expectations. Um, we've been chasing this since 2014. And we didn't get a 1st bite of the apple until 2018. Um, that's a very long time for a small business to go after an opportunity that we're, you know, day to day. We got to make sure that we're paying our, our bills and, you know, having places for employees to, to go. So it's setting expectation. It's almost like um, you almost have to think of it in the offshore wind um, year. Um, an offshore wind year is like maybe our two or three years. Um, really to be, you know, uh, very transparent about that. Um, so I would say as being the second wave, the great thing is the projects, they're here and they're coming, you know, and they're moving forward. So you have a long, I mean, you have a shorter runway um, so it's understanding that balance of getting the workforce ready and getting the businesses ready to be opportunity ready, but then also um, understanding and setting the expectations. We're still, especially in North Carolina, we're still a couple years off before anyone's going to see something tangible from a construction side. Now, with the professional services side, that's a different story. Um, but then also looking at the various states, and I sort of does a great job, New Jersey Economic Development does. Uh, Corporation does a great job. So just looking at all of the different state models that they currently have and being able to cherry pick, cherry pick the ones that you all like and then going from there. So I think you all have a great advantage than others. Uh, I want to say three things super, super fast. Uh, number one, echoing what Tara said, we're, we're <laughs> business network started in 2014 as a Maryland uh, based organization. We've expanded. We still don't have any uh, operational offshore wind farms in 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 Maryland, you know, 10 years later. <laughs> so we we always when we talk to businesses, we always preach you, you really have to understand that this is a long term thing that you have to plan for years in advance. Uh, number 2, the industry is already in North Carolina, though. Uh, uh, Southwire is going to be uh, doing the cables for the vineyard wind project. Uh, Hitachi, which is headquartered, I, I think they're manufacturing is elsewhere. But Hitachi is uh, one of the bidders in the New York or the New Jersey um, transmission bid that's going on right now. Uh, the business network tracks uh, contracts as, as closely as possible, and we've identified over two dozen that are already going to North Carolina companies. So, you know, be focused on the local economic development because you're building offshore wind 
right there, but also, you know, as, as the state is already doing a very good job, be very aware that you already have opportunities within the larger domestic supply chain. And uh, as a final thing, I'm very happy that uh, Jennifer Munt uh, talked about it. We have been encouraging states to think about floating and what floating actually looks like. It, you know, it took the first wave of states, it took them years to figure out what kind of infrastructure they needed for uh, fixed foundations and what kind of factories they needed and what kind of supply chain. Uh, it, you could get yourself a little ahead of the curve by starting to think about that for floating today. You know, even if we're not, even if we're talking about projects that are a decade off, this forethought exercise is incredibly valuable and will set the state of North Carolina up well for the future. Great. Any other committee members have a burning question about any topic that they just really want to throw out there before we wrap up? I just want to add a comment and it came up during a panel I was involved with at IPF and it was simply, you know, I focus on stakeholder outreach and, and I've tried to work with all of y'all. But um, one of the things when you get your, your developers are here, but we're contracting working with the tier ones and then they go down the tier 23s of all the different. And so I think it's important for those relationships as well, because as Scott said, do what you say you're going to do. You have to make sure that message gets all the way down the pipe to make sure that they're understanding what you promised to the community as well. So they're helping you live by what you said you're going to do. So that's just something to keep in mind for small businesses to make sure they have a grasp of what outreach has been done in order to make it very cohesive and it's very kumbaya and everybody's happy. Great point. Any Anything that our panelists um, want to leave us with or uh, sage advice that you didn't get to share that you really wanna make sure we're aware of? Just thank you so much for for including me in the conversation. It's so impressive. Like this kind of convening is so impressive. I'm just really excited for what will happen in North Carolina and standing by ready ready to help. Yeah, as Rebecca said, fantastic opportunity. Thank you ever so much. And uh, uh, really good engagement, early engagement. And, and with Avon Grid Renewables, we'll be happy to help you know, wherever we can. I'll just add to that on behalf of RW, thank you for the opportunity. We really enjoyed um, engaging with the communities over the last uh, nine months here and really hope the uh, opportunity continues to continue to engage with you all. Um, yep, let, echoing everyone else, um, industry follows state leadership. So, um, so, you know, the group that you have assembled here and Governor Cooper's leadership in this area, you know, you're bringing businesses to the state by by engaging in this. So, thank you. And thank you for allowing me to come down and uh, speak with you all and share my experience from a, a small minority owned business. Thank you. And we'll continue the thank yous to thank all of you very much for taking time to join us today for the committee members for your participation and for Marquita for putting us all together. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Susan, for facilitating and Sam Eaton. Scott. Hewitt Gudgeon, Rebecca Karp, Sam Salustro, Tierra Strum. We truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. We know how difficult it is coordinating schedules for something like this at just the right time. But that conversation was very informative to our team here, and we do appreciate it. Thank you again. And now uh, we will break for lunch. We uh, will reconvene at 1.30. I'd like to take this time before we do break to thank Crowley for sponsoring lunch today with a special thank you to Arkita Howard for arranging it. Thank you, Arkita. And um, again, we'll be back at 1.30. Mute your, we will ask the microphones to be muted during lunch, please. Oh, one, one final thing. There will be a presentation during lunch. Dana Magliola is gonna present um, approximately 12.30, 12.35. So if you will be back in place, we'll, we have a little free time. Okay. Thank you.
where you know, if you see so it's the darling of them all on every kid, but I'm fun to think about all sorts of friends ideas. I come home and you get like a down in the legislature at the or somebody who goes a little shit out. Eating Jim's walls out. So that's you know. Extraordinarily other about how we pay. Here, you know, but we should write a general summary to us what you or to the Santas have done to the Spoofers. I mean, you know, you just. I gotta say, I'm shocked by the Santas that we had in here. Well, everyone, we will be starting our lunchtime presentation in about two more minutes. If you could make your way to your seats, please. Well, it is the mix of the it's just like it's a conservation issue. Yeah, it's certainly it's We're in this. It's just like helping. This conversation still has to be right now. On the I'm going to run both just because I've got a note to use that off. So I'm going to do this and. All right, we will be yeah. starting our presentation in a few moments on the supply chain for economic development. I'd like to remind you that this meeting is being recorded. If you are participating virtually, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Also, we will let you know that the slides from today's meeting, uh, the presentations will be available on the NC Towers website. So please check that out if you want to have more information about the task force or the uh, uh, slides that the uh, presentations that were made today. Also, if you joined us late and did not sign in, if you're a visitor, please sign our sign up sheet in the bag. We'd like to know who was with us today. And with that. All right, we're ready to go. Dana, give me one moment. Okay. Possible.
All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. We are ready to start our presentation. <clears throat> Dana Magliola. Dana Magliola is the program manager for freight and logistics programs for the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Dana leads the North Carolina Department of Transportation's logistics and freight program as part of NCDOT rail division and series as DO, NCDOT supply chain subject matter expert. Connecting the economy to infrastructure investment, Dana is active across the spectrum of NCDOT project delivery from planning through construction. And with that, Dana, we welcome you. Thank you, Chair, Chairwoman Mark, uh, Wilton. Thank you so much for having me. Again, Dana Magliola, great to be here with you this afternoon. Um, you know, my mission at DOT is uh, to talk a lot about the supply chain, educate in our agency and with our stakeholders. Um, and I'm, but I'm a firm believer that, that, that transportation is one of the most powerful levers for economic development. And in the offshore wind space, that is absolutely true. Uh, thrilled to be a part of uh, this effort in general, just to professionally, but also personally to see this sector thrive in North Carolina, uh, something we're really looking forward to. Uh, as Chair Welton mentioned, uh, this is what I do at DOT. You know, my connection to industry and bringing the conversations that are being had in the commercial market and industrial marketplace into the decisions we're making and the policies and investments we make at DOT. That's my everyday job. Um, my background is in maritime and freight forwarding and, uh, you know, connecting those sectors now with government is, is a big part of what we do. Uh, I'm also proud of staff liaison for the uh, in infrastructure, environmental justice, and inclusion subcommittee, which um, I believe we've recognized is is that the best one? I think it was, right, Jennifer? Yeah. So thanks for having me up. First of all, thank you to NC Ports for an awesome tour yesterday. If you had a chance to visit the port, it is an eye-opening experience. I describe it as very Discovery Channel-like. The scale, the activity, just the connection to the global marketplace right there right on the Cape Fear River. So thank you to the, the team there at, at NC Ports. Uh, I, get, I wanna get us together for a couple of objectives. I like to have objectives when I speak and really the objective today is to broaden your understanding of the supply chain in North Carolina and how important it is to our state. Introducing some key concepts, the current affairs of what's happening in the supply chain. And then we're gonna wrap it up and bring it back home and how that ties into the offshore wind sector. I really wanna arm developers, uh, st all stakeholders in this process, more about where the supply chain is relevant. So much like the NC Towers Committee, we're all operating on a shared baseline, a shared understanding of the situation. So we all know about the supply chain, compliments of toilet paper. And I will ask if you've seen, I've, I've, I've got a lot of new material in here, but a couple of old good old fashioned slides you've seen, if you save the booze until the end, uh, I'll appreciate that. We're gonna jump in and define the supply chain. And in North Carolina, one of the things to think about is the end user, the consumer, the customer, and think about how we create value that gets to that end user. Um, I also wanna recognize that North Carolina is a unique place and our supply chain is gonna be different than any other state. Um, if you take both of the cases um, of just general economic development or focused offshore wind sector development and supply chain development, that holds true as well. This is going to be a unique experience and a unique exercise for our state. Sorry, I'm running two slip switches, so. So the basic, most basic definition of the supply chain is the process by which information, goods and materials, products or services create value. And you'll notice creating value, this can be multifaceted from its most basic form, uh, illustrated right here, but you notice that value creation goes up. And one of the most important things that happens is that information goes in every direction and more and more the supply chain drive is driven by information. An example of a complex supply chain, you know, you can get into all levels of vertical integration, working in different contracting uh, verticals. You've got really complicated supply chain for simple products. Uh, and that's completely normal within uh, the industrial space. This is the nitty gritty of supply chain, right? This is the actual activities key act or not a collective list, uh, but many of the key activities around the supply chain. So everything from sourcing raw materials through manufacturing and then distribution to that end marketplace. 
Um, this is really the, the sort of the detail level that we're going to get into the further we get down the road. But I want to give this quick overview. And I think that when we talk about how large a sector it is and how important a sector it is, it's important to recognize that we're talking about a lot of direct uh, impact, economic impact on our state. Um, report a little bit of, of data data now, 2016. Um, we're actually updating this study now. Um, but you're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in value add or state GDP. Um, legislators like to talk about taxes. You know, we're contributing a lot of taxes from the supply chain into communities at the state and local level. And this is really a major factor. And there's a ripple effect. There's clearly a ripple effect, and this is something we, we will talk about with offshore wind explicitly, but say you build, you build a new factory or you're bringing in manufacturing to a, a, a site, you're going to see that investment in one sector ripple into others, jobs, restaurants, uh, just some of the details here in particular on the supply chain in North Carolina. So what does a supply chain actually look like? I, I wanna take us beyond the definition and, uh, you know, sometimes I'll speak to, to classes and I'll ask anyone who knows what this is to raise their hand and less hands go up these days. But if you know what this is, raise your hand. All right. All right. Good. My, my movie references will be on, on target as well. Uh, this deconstructed BlackBerry smartphone uh, really does show just how complex a product can be. Um, but I want to take a simple, what might seem like a simple product and look at it Look at what the supply chain looks like. You know, e-commerce is a major uh, sort of change agent in the industrial space. And you look at the complexity of an e-commerce supply chain ecosystem from production, from raw materials. It's not that simple line that we saw from a point A to point B. And that's really important to take into account, not just in e-commerce, as you look at some of sort of the complexity of this dual coast distribution based model. Now there's all kinds of other distribution models. You know, we live in a world of Amazon Prime and you're targeting uh, fulfillment centers within X number of miles or travel time from major consumer bases. So even this is, sh is shifting dramatically. Let's take this product. And uh, I talked to Dr. Rosen uh, earlier, and he had mentioned he had seen me talk about this specific product before. Uh, you know, VF Industries, a North Carolina based company, has great visibility into their supply chain. A lot of this ties into corporate social responsibility, ties into competitiveness, um, and really the right thing to do for a company, especially as your end consumer wants to know more and more about, you know, where did this product come from and how was it made? How did it get here? Um, I think that that is a cultural shift that as an offshore wind sector, we are recognizing how important it is and how much um, hope people have in the offshore wind sector to start to make some, some macroeconomic changes for us, especially when it comes to uh, environmental impact. But let's take this Thermo Ball Eco hoodie, right? And um, can you guys darken that a little bit? Is it, it's pretty bright. Can you all see the map on the right side? All right, yeah, if you can darken that, that would be outstanding. Um, over here on your right, you've got a map of uh, bear with us. It, it's kind of important to see the map because really that's part of the story I'm trying to tell. All right. Okay. Yeah, if you can jump to that slide, that would be great. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. Do I have control back? Okay. So right here, you see a, basically a global image of this product supply chain, and you're seeing it start out with assembly and, and uh, uh, 
uh, subcomponents really will take this down to a clock to subcomponent level in different locations across Southeast Asia uh, and then you know in marketplaces in the United States. Distribution centers, frac uh, factories, fra uh, textile mills. This product, we're gonna zoom in really closely on this part of Southeast Asia. And you just see how the transportation footprint of manufacturing this jacket starts to pan out at the regional level. There's a lot of movement here of different components and different parts from, you know, all along the assembly of what Wright thinks is a simple textile garment, right? We're gonna zoom in even closer. We're gonna try and zoom in even closer. In this area alone, I'm looking at, at material suppliers. Think about the sourcing that goes into this stock, into this this garment. And this is a what would be maybe a major metro region uh, in, in China, and there's a lot of activity. And you'll see dynamics here in this industry that we're going to deal with in the offshore wind sector too. And that is watching where product supply chains move generally because of labor and labor costs. And so you see a lot of what's manufactured into certain work in progress in Southeast Asia is gonna to move to lower uh, labor, lower wage labor markets, such as in Vietnam and Laos. Garment manufacturing, again, local sourcing and fabric mills. And then all of it. To the, to the United States of America, generally in a shipping container. You saw those at the Port of Wilmington yesterday. That is how the world moves. So that's really what a supply chain looks like. It's less jargon. It's less, uh, you know, the headings on different departments in the big corporation, you know, from procurement to contracts. Uh, it's a physical movement of product and a value creation. Offshore wind is going to do a similar thing and does that at the global scale already. So I want to bring us to some current issues in the supply chain. And we all know what the supply chain is now, complements of the pandemic, and there's a lot happening. You know, I've often described we have a, um, there's a new technology hype cycle. There's, a, there's hype cycles for all kinds of things. I think the supply chain is also in a hype cycle, and we're at risk of it becoming a buzzword you know, if we don't understand it well enough. Uh, and Glenn, you and I talked a little bit about buzzwords. It's all becoming kind of jargony. Other than current supply issues, I like to call this holy supply chain Batman because that's the world we're living in and things are blowing up around us here. So national headlines were never about supply chain. You know, my, uh, my career path here was below the radar. And any time that we saw headlines, it was on things like the Journal of Commerce or something went really wrong, like pirates seized a vessel uh, and legitimately experiences I've had. So um, national headlines about the supply chain, federal, you know, presidential administration focus on the supply chain. This is not new or this is not something we're used to, um, but it is the new normal. And it's something that much like inflation, import export, we're starting to talk about people recognize the larger context in which the supply chain operates in our macro economy, <laughs> in our national domestic economy, and in how we interact with the world marketplace. <clears throat> so clearly supply chain volatility uh, is a major issue in industry right now. And that's from everything from getting reliable uh, suppliers who can then source reliable supplies from their suppliers. And when one of those break down, we watch how it, it holds everything uh, at, on pause. It stops assembly lines, and that's a very expensive situation. That's going to be a major concern as offshore wind transitions into the American marketplace, into the domestic marketplace. Uh, high visibility sectors really gave us an, an understanding of it. You know, you can't get your new Dodge. It's Dodge. It is Dodge. What is it, Ram Truck Month? And we can't get a Ram Truck because of semiconductors. And I gotta tell you, that's probably something that the inventory at Dodge Ram, they weren't thinking about semiconductors, you know? And that's the kind of uh, part of the general lexicon that supply chain has become. Uh, retail consumer shift is a major part. I talked a little bit about this is a, an e-commerce supply chain snapshot. Well, everything is e-commerce to some degree now. Uh, again, another kind of thing when I speak to, to students in, in the college situation, I like to say, has anybody ordered anything since I started speaking on their phone? And 
you'd, you'd honestly be surprised that a hand occasionally comes up. Um, it's that easy. The world is e-commerce. Uh, then we got to things that were beyond the pandemic. We got into things like supplier problems in the petrochemical industry, where you had a once in a lifetime ice storm hit Texas, uh, shut down petrochemical processing plants without the proper shutdown procedures. And it took them a month to get back on track, to get back production. Uh, that worked its way into foam. You can't get the petrochemicals uh, source stock. I'm gonna mess up the vocab there. Um, you can't get that foam into your RV. And guess what people were buying a lot of during the pandemic? RVs, boats, furniture. You you, know, you want the comfy chair to, to work from home? That foam is a petrochemical product at the end of its supply chain. And those were on back order. And this is still something we're, we're, we're fighting through right now. Inflation, we hear a lot about that. There's a war going on. There's the et cetera here is bold for a reason because this is not an exhaustive list. And this is absolutely... Uh, a major issue, supply chain volatility globally, locally. Look at the pandemic, especially, you know, goods and services, the two sides of the of the of the coin here. You know, goods were uh, major hit. Supply took a major hit here. Goods, of course, came back above above average and has recovered. Uh, services, the services sector is recovering, and this is a little bit of dated data, and you'll continue to see these trends increasing towards the average or continuing to exceed the average on here. But this is macroeconomic. This is not something happening only in North Carolina. Supply chain demand, uh, supply and demand mayhem. You know, this is areas where all of a sudden, like I mentioned with RVs and boats, uh, there's a major demand that there wasn't there before. If you install pools, you are under significant demand. You have a long wait list uh, that you are serving to put a, a pool in someone's house. Things like that, the demand that did not exist uh, in a normal setting, the paradigm shift has created those, those panic buttons. Uh, transportation rates, you know, trucking rates, container shipping rates, you know, container carriers are posting record profits right now. Capacity on the water is goes from overcapacity to severely constrained to we don't know what's going on on the water and everything in between. That's a major part of uh, a supply chain planners uh, business. Their life is to not always deliver speed, but to deliver predictability. Speed is great, but predictability you can build around. Uh, and that's something that's very hard, very hard to, to continue with. Truck driver shortages, you've got cross-border shortages on trucking because there's protests. I mean, there's a lot happening in this space. There's a lot happening in this space 10 years ago. You weren't hearing about it on the evening news. We're hearing about it on the evening news now. We're seeing it in the papers. Union negotiation, you've got both major maritime unions renegotiating within the, in the next four years. In fact, at one point, they were overlapped on what year that was going to be. Um, that's working out well. Those uh, sectors are moving towards agreement, uh, which is always good because the day the boxes stop, the day all the boxes stop. Uh, intermodal boom, the transition from uh, coastal distribution centers into putting things in an intermodal container to go from the, the port onto a rail, into a DC, closer to the marketplace. Those, those are trending up. Uh, and, you know, Name, image, and likeness roster challenges. If you're a basketball fan, a college basketball fan like I am, this is a big issue. Now, granted, maybe not supply chain, but the basic story here is, is that the supply chain is so hot right now. And so that's my other reference, hopefully, that catches this audience. So say things keep moving, and they get here. They get on that, that eco hoodie, gets to usually the Port of Los Angeles, excuse me, the Port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, it's gonna look like this. And these are a little bit of uh, actual shots off of LA Long Beach. It used to be 60 vessels. It's down to 20 plus vessels at, you know, on queue, waiting to come in, waiting for that berth. East Coast ports have had congestion in Savannah and Norfolk uh, and in New York. One of the great things about Wilmington is we've, the throughput, the productivity of this port has prevented uh, Wilmington from backing up. And in fact, they've benefited from um, uh, having cargo sent there when it can't get into savannah we're going to go to wilmington diversions they've benefited from diversions kind of like in the airline industry turnaround time is is, is extended 
people are holding on to their cargo at, you know, waiting for it to arrive. And that costs money. The time that inventory is not on that shelf, able to convert inventory costs money and it's money they could be spending elsewhere. Uh, wrinkles in Asia, the sort of zero COVID policy in, in, in China, a major manufacturing zone has a significant impact on the rest of the world. You know, you know, 350 ships, this was as of last month, 350 ships at Q, you know, in the port of Shanghai. That's a major increase and it's going up. Uh, 75 days longer on product from China to the United States. And let me tell you a lot of product, everything moves from China to the United States. That's a major trade lane there. Sanctions, uh, fuel prices, you know, this is an economic indicator looking at price of fuel in Sim Singapore. The pri price of fuel in Singapore way up and, you know, the price of fuel in Wilmington is way up. That's not shocking. But when you're talking about the scale and um, volume of, uh, of fuel that's purchased, bunker fuel uh, in the maritime industry, that's a major concern. And then we're seeing sanctions at most, most international ports uh, for Russian and Belarusian uh, vessels and Russian, the Russian sector is a major player in the energy sector. This is not news to anyone here, but you know, that's finding its way into the maritime world. So I want to bring it home a little bit and talk a little bit about supply chain ecosystems. And I don't want ecosystem to sound like a buzzword because we're going to hear it, but that's just because that's reality. Nothing operates, nothing happens in a silo. Um, you don't always hear that from people in government, right? Uh, this is a integrated, uh, involved, a, a matrix type world that we live in, and especially what's going we're going to see develop around offshore wind. So one of the exercises that I like to take people through is there's some resources in the state of North Carolina for for site selection, economic developers. This exercise is. Um, Finding a sweet spot for a company, and this is a geographic, this is a sort of a map based exercise that I'll take us through briefly, but let's find that right spot that sweet spot that can sustain their business that can sustain their manufacturing and development. Uh, in this example, we're an economic developer recruiting a consumer products company, a manufacturing co consumer products company. Uh, they could be making deodorant, they could be making some sort of consumer product. They're going to need to grow their supplier base where they want to operate. And right now, this is the exact same conversation we're having in North Carolina. We want offshore wind to thrive here, and we want the supplier base to grow. We want the, the ecosystem here to develop, to make it sustainable, make it profitable. Uh, this consumer uh, products company, they're going to need packaging, labeling, machinery manufacturing, all of the things that go along with just regular old manufacturing, unrelated to whatever sector it happens to be. Uh, this is a great database, by the way, manufactured NC managed by the uh, North Carolina Manufacturing Extension Partnership here, the MEP, the Hollings MEP, um, tons of data in here. Uh, great place to start. But so we're looking at this uh, triad region right here, and we, we know what kind of company we are, and we've identified these are the kind of companies that we need to work around. And well, this is looking like a really sweet spot, right? We want to save on this. One of the objectives here is saving on transportation costs, saving on logistics complexity, those things that will eventually benefit the offshore wind sector as it grows. You've got manufacturing here. You've got machinery, a machine shop. You've got printing. You've got packaging. They should probably locate somewhere in this little area. That's a quick exercise, right? And it's pretty logical. There's not a whole lot of like deep thinking there. The challenge that we face is what do what does what sweet spots exist right now in North Carolina and where are we growing those sweet spots? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, an ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem of suppliers. Uh, th that's so important here for, for costs, for operations, for predictability. Uh, even a long supply chain, a complicated supply chain, if predictable is manageable for profitability and sustainability. Asking manufacturers uh, to optimize that supply chain, you know, you're looking with companies to relocate in North Carolina. We're looking at companies in North Carolina to pivot into this new and very lucrative sector. Um, this is the kind of thing that we have to think about. The development of second and third tier suppliers is economic development for OEMs. 
this is chumming the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher some fishing terms, Glenn, keep me honest. We are chumming the water. We are chumming the water uh, for the OEMs and the, the environment we create uh, in the business environment we create, the policy environment we create. I honestly think the cultural environment we create with enthusiasm and passion for offshore wind is a, is a differentiator for our state. We want this to be here. So uh, that's super important. And as OEMs, these major companies, major manufacturers see what we're doing here, they realize the commitment is here and that the, the meat is on the bone. North Carolina's you know, competitive advantage has for so long been manufacturing and it continues to be so. I like this quote from, from MEP. They've optimized supply chains, they're ready to grow, they're ready to innovate. And that's what we want in this space. This is a rapidly changing in economic sector and we wanna be ready to move with it. I love this resource also. I share this with most of my audiences. This is an outstanding database. Uh, that the Southeastern Wind Coalition puts together. And really, I like that they've thrown a large net on what is relevant to offshore wind. Will somebody let Steve in? I think he's locked. Or maybe not, I don't know. Do we wanna let Steve in? Um, one of the great things you see here, and this is semi-obvious if you look at most, most industrial development in North Carolina, is there's a lot of activity on the crescent, on the crescent between the triangle, the triad, and, and down to Charlotte. Um, but there's a lot of activity happening elsewhere. And this is a great database. You can go in and you can search it. This literally just articulates how important the ecosystem is, because as we look at developing installations over here and installations over here, and then eventually installations all over here, and we want to serve them from North Carolina, this ecosystem is what we have to continue to grow. And I'm really happy to see when it's inside these borders right here. Not to be, you know, a home team advantage person here, but when it's in North Carolina, that's part of the objective. Even if we're serving New Jersey wind farms. So looking at some of the data, now there's some great reports and I tried to do a bit of cliff notes on these and bring these in. You've, made, you've gotten copies of them. This one in particular is a deep dive assessment done by uh, Department of Energy. This is great reading and it's at a domestic level. This is the U.S. marketplace, but there's so much in here that's true for us. And so much of it is articulated opportunity on where we're buying stuff now. We are buying stuff from China, Brazil, Indonesia, Spain, China, India, Germany, South Korea, you name it. We're buying stuff internationally in these little rainbows of wind specific equipment imports Every one of those is an opportunity for us to start to figure out where do we provide a competitive advantage? Where do we need to invest to be providing those inputs, those components, those services? These are some of the things we have to think about. You know, labor costs. Right now, Europe has an advantage on, on labor because they have a, a workforce that's been doing this. I don't think anyone brings to bear uh, the resources of developing workforce in North Carolina. This is a powerhouse for that, whether it's the people that live here or the organizations and agencies that are tasked with growing that. This is a place where we can develop that competitive advantage. Cost of materials is challenging, but at the same time, domestic manufacturing of components, domestic sourcing of raw materials, innovating to find alternatives to hard to find, hard to source expensive raw materials is another big part of the U.S. Uh, advantage here. Transportation costs, logistics costs, those are the kinds of things we're talking around investment. Where can we invest in our infrastructure to make it easier to install, easier to manufacture, easier to, to put wind power front and center in North Carolina and on the U.S. East Coast? And then regulatory challenges. Are our policies right? And, and there's a lot of talk about what are the right policies? And there's a lot of audiences. What are the right policies for commercial fishing? What are the right policies for the environment? What are the right policies for economic development? And there's a good, the good news is, is that that Venn diagram has a whole lot of overlap. And I think one of the benefits of seeing this committee active and being involved is this committee represents a very well overlapped Venn diagram of stakeholders. So you look at this sort of the different verticals and I, I 
tell Hans at the port, if I use the word verticals, he owes me $5 because he loves that word. But if you think about all of these activities and pro the products that, are, that make up offshore wind, you can kind of go through this and you can say, well, we've got steel, we've got concrete, we've got cables, we've got foundation, we can do this, we can do that. Maybe we can't do this, right? Or maybe we can't do this at the scale that the industry demands now. This to me is the gap analysis and that, that, that's, that we think about. Where are we lacking and where are the places that we can then put our stake in the ground to say, do this in North Carolina? We're talking about major capital investment and a lot of capital investment that is not necessarily site specific, right? Support structure and foundation, uh, turbine. I mean, th this is probably logistics and installation. A lot of that is site specific, but a lot of it's not. And this is the big exclamation point that we've put on this, uh, you know, whole effort is we're not just here to grow offshore wind in North Carolina. We're here to make North Carolina the resource to offshore wind that it can be for all of US, you know, East Coast development uh, right now. And it's important to think, I mean, we're talking about uh, a, a long-term game. And I think we heard that from the first panel, you know, small businesses have to think, how do we stay active for a couple of years till it hits? Big businesses have to recognize that a lot can change in their planning. So I'll take this back to another report that I think is outstanding and I'm sure we've all seen it, but this is the uh, North Carolina um, study on the supply chain here at BVG, Timmins, NC State, Department of Commerce. Um, if you have not seen this, you need to read it. It's very important, but look at this curve going up as we get into more and more investment, more and more development. And this is a long game. This is 2035 folks. Um, this is a long game, and I think that that's something we've all we've all said it, we've heard it. I think we've internalized it, but again, always worth restating. So, what's missing? Again, I talk about gap analysis, but this is really the simple question we're asking: What's missing in North Carolina? What part is missing? And I think that the good news is that there are just parts. We're in the game. We're in the game from day one with relevant manufacturing, experience, workforce, policy, all of that stuff puts us at the start line ready to go. Um, and we're running now. So this finding the areas where, like I mentioned, semiconductors, rare earth materials, are there innovations that we can bring to the conversation that, that replace these? Or are there ways that we can create value? Or are there times that we recognize this is not our strength and we invest around it and we invest in other things that are important? And that's sometimes a really important question to answer. Uh, the Jones Act is a significant challenge to the development of the sector, uh, and I have the asterisk here is, don't get me started, on the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. Uh, you know, this says that American flag vessels have to serve the industry, dredging. There's so many wrinkles here that the Jones Act is a part of. Uh, I also love, much like supply chain, that in the last month or two, people know what the Jones Act is, outside of a couple of like, sort of industry nerds like myself. Um, and, and I'm not wrong, it's kind of crazy to see people talk about it. And then workforce. Workforce, again, falls into that same development timeline. We need these kind of skill sets now. What kind of skill sets do we need later? That timeline is super important when you're putting money and investing in workforce development. This is another great resource and just one I want to highlight briefly uh, as I get a little bit here towards the end. Um, and this is something that the quiz afterwards you guys will want to remember. These areas where we are strong, whether it's foundations, wind turbine, electrical balance, and I just pulled a couple of these. This is our opportunity matrix right here that I think we all need to look at and spend some time on. The work that was done in this report is outstanding, and it, it is the homework we need to do before we make those decisions. Uh, I think the gentleman from Offshore uh, Network for the Business Network for Offshore Wind mentioned, you guys should get in there and you should do a report, do a report on this, but this is part of that. Uh, and this, this is one of those things that I think is a great resource. Let's talk again about what's here today. Manufacturing capabilities are here. This North Carolina is a juggernaut of manufacturing, whether that is traditional manufacturing, whether that is additive manufacturing, whether that is anything in between. Um, 
you know, and then the service ecosystem around it, the service providers, the that part of the economy is all healthy and thriving here. And then you've got resources for growth and development. Uh, you know, one of my experiences working with the industrial extension service at NC State was going in and working with small to medium sized businesses on supply chain digitization. You know, we've put that aside as a main topic, the digitization of everything, because it's now it's just there's no question about it anymore. That's just table stakes. We have opportunities. We can recycle material here. We have domestic availability on some raw materials. Uh, the innovation technology and workforce is here, you know, except for blades. And, and that's only blades at scale. There's very few things that we can't do in North Carolina or that we couldn't do with the right investment, workforce and policy. So I'll end this with, I'll try and end this, here we go, with some supply chain trees. We're gonna, we're gonna zoom back out again. We're gonna zoom back out from offshore wind and we're gonna recognize that supply chain asset investment, commercial investment follows the marketplace. And this is something we're seeing every day as you see in this great picture here from cold storage at the Port of Wilmington of Smithfield export product ready to go to the world. The investment that the Port of North Carolina has made in cold storage mirrors a global trend in billions of dollars, seven, what is it? 18.6 billion dollars within the next few years. 2027 is not far away. And you see that investment in an important commercial space growing. We see it here in Wilmington. Offshore wind's biggest challenge here is the marketplace's concern, the vulnerability here is that we don't have certain demand. We have uncertain demand in the offshore wind pipeline, right? That's the thing we hear about so much. But this is not uncertain demand, folks. This is a challenge, but to me, this is confirmation that the demand in North Carolina is real. North Carolina wants the industry to thrive here. We're committed to it, committed to offshore wind power sector development, supply chain development, and to doing it right. The fact that the governor was there to speak at IPF last week, meeting with folks, this is a significant exclamation point on how real North Carolina takes this, how big an opportunity this is. And to me, this, this, this helps tackle a lot of that uncertain demand for me. Recommended reading, we are gonna hear about from our subcommittee later. And I'll we'll make sure that we share this. This is a great uh, document that's come out of the Department of Commerce here. Um, highlighting some of the facts and fundamental values around how we as a state go about growing offshore wind, whether it's at the commercial level or by engaging in, in some of the conversations we have to have. So that's my presentation for today. I hope I brought it home to offshore wind that you learned a little bit about the supply chain. I didn't see anyone doze off and there were only a few Amazon packages purchased along the way. Uh, my job is a resource to you, whether you're an agency, an economic developer, commercial industry. I am a resource for how supply chain works and how transportation infrastructure and investment plays along with that, the decisions we make with the billions of dollars we're tasked to spend responsibly. So please reach out, uh, feel free to connect with me. Uh, I do birthday parties, bar mitzvahs, you know, we're ready to go, we're ready to go. Thank you all for having me. Uh, Chair Welton, thank you for having me as well. Do we have any questions for Dana? Yeah, happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Are there any questions for Dana? Uh, Dr. Rosen from UNC Wilmington now said there's a 200 plus thousand jobs waiting to be filled in North Carolina, in the United States. Have we looked at how many of those are relevant to offshore wind, if I captured that question correctly? Um, I think that the uh, analysis is a part of the study that was done on the supply chain. I think it's ongoing. Um, I don't have specific studies in mind that I could answer that question. What's I got to tell you, I don't know, but I feel like that the holistic approach that we're taking, it's definitely going to be a part of that conversation because that may be the short term careers that we talked about that are low hanging fruit to pull people into the workforce. Or it may be structural. It might be something that we need to start changing curriculum to introduce new concepts. Um, and I know you've seen that uh, in the Cameron School of Business. You're teaching things today that weren't even a thing, you know, five and 10 years ago. So. Chair, Chair Walton. Any other questions? Jennifer. 
Yeah, I wanted. I, I'd like to chime in. I think I might have a, a, a general answer for you. Uh, National Renewable Energy Labs released a report about a month ago where they uh, studied the workforce needs for offshore wind specifically, and they estimate that in order to meet the 30 gigawatt goal that was set by the Biden administration this time last year, we'll need about 50, 55,000 FTEs between now and 2030 to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have a lot of work to do. Yes. Got a lot of work to do. That that's national, just to be clear. Okay, thank, thank you again. Thank you, Dana. So we can take about a all right, we have eight minutes. Take about five minutes because I know it's gonna take you three minutes to get back <laughs> from the five. And then we will um have an update on the Wilmington East Lease from Jennifer Munt. So we have about five minutes. Returning at one thirty.
All right, if we could return to our seats, please, we will get started with the Wilmington East lease update. All right, it is 1.30, we are resuming our meeting. And uh, at this time, Jennifer Munt, Assistant Secretary for Clean Energy at the North Carolina Department of Commerce will present an update on the Wilmington East lease, also known as Carolina Long Bay lease area. Thank you. Madam Chair and members of the task force, it's always a pleasure to be up here and uh, talk with you whether I'm prepared or not. <laughs> I'm prepared for this one and I appreciate it. But first, before I uh, launch in on the quick update on the Carolina Long Bay lease upcoming, I just want to uh, clear, I want to uh, fix the number that I announced before in terms of the FTEs that we think the offshore wind supply chain and all of the sector development are gonna require between now and in 2030. I miss, I misremembered the number. NREL um, estimated, and it's a pretty wide estimate, between 12,000 and 43,000 FTEs. And it, it's based on how they, like, what numbers they put into their model. But even so, that's a goodly number of jobs to support the sector going forward. Okay, quick transition, Carolina Long Bay lease auction upcoming. And just really quickly, the last time we met back in February, this was still on our short horizon. We didn't know what the contours of this lease would look like. And so I thought it might be helpful just to articulate what is in the final sale notice that Bellum published at the end of March. And in that final sale notice, Bellum sets out the parameters for the lease auction, which is gonna be held on May 11th. And I know we're all going to be watching that with bated breath to see the outcome from the 16 legally, technically, and financially qualified bidders who are who might be putting in minimum bids for one or both of the two lease areas that they have been identified. Some of those some of those organizations and entities are represented on our task force and are might have been represented by members of the public who've been attending with us here today. So I want to talk a little bit about these two lease areas that are identified in the blue and the green polygons on the slide that y'all are looking at right now. Um, I think it's really um, illustrative of the process by which Boehm goes through to, de to continue the deconfliction of the appropriate areas for uh, offshore wind or other renewable energy development in, in the outer continental shelf. The bold line around that polygon in or represents the Wilmington wind energy area, 
the Wilmington East wind energy area as it was contemplated coming out of the efforts that it, that Boeing went through through the early part through the early to mid 2010s. Um, the hatched area it reflects the area that was proposed in the proposed sale notice that Boehm published back in October of last year on which it collected a host of comments and feedback from all manner of stakeholders. And then, like I said, the areas that are indicated in dark blue and light green represent the areas even whittled down further based on Boehm's consideration of the comments and feedback that it received. Some of the, if you see on the northern portion of the areas that were removed, that constitutes about 10 or 11,000 acres. And that was to move the leading edge of the wind energy area to the south by so that it is 20 statute miles from its nearest land or shore point. And then the areas that are just to the east of the dark blue, or excuse me, to the west of the dark blue area and to the southern or to the southeast of the light green area are reflective of comments that were made by the US Coast Guard regarding shipping and uh, further information that's coming from that entity. And so I think that just a, is a great example of how Bowen continues to work with, listen, and consider stakeholder feedback as it continues through the process to develop offshore wind projects responsibly in partnership with all stakeholders up and up and down the coast. And so <clears throat> wanna say a little bit about this area in addition to the the physical area itself, you'll notice that Boehm did split the availability for the auction or the area available for auction into two mostly equitable areas that Boehm felt would provide um, the opportunity for viable commercial development. Uh, each area is approximately 55,000 acres and Boehm estimates that estimates that in total they could um, they could yield a conservative estimate of 1.3 gigawatts of power once fully built out. I, I would leave it to the developers and their representatives in the room to speak to how conservative an estimate that may well be. And we might could see much more power generated from development in that area. Talking a little bit about the auction, Bellum for the first time uh, since the mid-teens, but has actually pursued this now with Carolina Long Bay as, as um, I don't know if guinea pig is the right word, but as, uh, as a, uh, goodness, I'm not coming up with the right word. We're going to go with guinea pig. <laughs> We're going to be a part, uh, or this lease auction is going to include what's known as a multi-factor auction. And the format is going to, is going to include both a monetary and a non-monetary factor that will serve as a quote bidding credit and the bidding credits will can can represent up to 20 or yeah, up to 20 percent of the developer's monetary bid and that 20 percent would go towards the um the build out of a domestic offshore wind supply chain and the build out and the development of workforce training and supports in the in the u.s and so that, or both, and so a, a developer could develop, could create a program that addresses one or both of those types of projects. A qualifying bidding credit of that 20% of the, of the um, bid that a bidder make, or that a, a qualified bidder makes, of that 20%, the bidder would be committing at least 80% of that towards the uh, standing up and implementation of those programs that they contemplate. Um, and those credits, like I said, would go to workforce training or supply chain development or both. As part of the qualifications, the bidders are required to include a conceptual strategy for how they would meet those bidding credit requirements. Their strategy ultimately has to have objective quantifiable and verifiable steps that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management can evaluate to determine whether or not or confirm the compliance with that strategy as it's set out. <clears throat> the 
lessee or the winning bidder has to demonstrate pro progress towards meeting the components of that strategy. On or before the first facility design report is submitted to Bellum, and that's several years down the beyond the leasing the lease auction stage. And if the commitments that are that are initially made by the winning uh, lessee are not met um, in the form of the programs and projects that they put into this uh, into this bidding credit, then they will correspondingly be required to provide the monetary value of that plus the interest over the term between when the lease was issued and that date back to the um, back to the agency and that money will go into the federal treasury. And so to that end, our agency and uh, Dana uh, referenced this towards the end of his presentation. In, in an effort to help inform and guide um, qualified bidders or um, potential lessees as to what the state feels are our fundamental values and preferences for approaching the development of those uh, workforce training, supply chain, or you know, infrastructure investment strategies that they might be making in North Carolina, we put together a statement of facts and fundamental values. And what we've done is try to help identify options for investing in those bidding credits that provide for the best outcomes for North Carolina. I would note that, and I, I hope you caught on to the fact that Boehm put out in the final sale notice that they are offering this bidding credit to help induce and create opportunities for the promotion of a domestic supply chain and domestic workforce. We would very much like to see that supply chain and workforce blossom in North Carolina specifically, and maybe bleed over into our smart power partner states in Maryland and Virginia, but we wanna see most of the benefit here. And so what that's what this document tries to articulate and project. First, the document describes what I think is our very supportive policy environment. Uh, first and foremost, Governor Cooper's House 951, uh, or I should say the bipartisan legislation that Governor Cooper signed last year, Energy Solutions for North Carolina, House Bill 951, which sets us on a target to reduce our carbon emissions by 70% uh, by 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 sends those signals to the industry that we are looking for a diverse uh, energy resource mix. And I think offshore wind can provide, uh, you know, just just the fit, just to, the fit to that need. Um, the other um, policies that surround this include EO218, which created this task force and and set the offshore wind development goals of 2.8 gigawatts by the end of this decade and 8 gigawatts of development by the end of 2040, as well as reference back to EO, EO's 80 and then EO246 that was adopted just this year that moves the entire state towards a uh, clean energy economy, not just in the power sector, but across all sectors in the state. Watching the feedback there. We also point in this document to our strong workforce, which we've heard a lot about thus far, and I will leave to the uh, workforce subcommittee to speak to um, on their own, but we are led by the, the vision that is in our first in talent strategy that our department released last year. And then we also obviously have a very strong business environment. We've heard several times about how we're number one in manufacturing on the East Coast, number five in the nation. We've got great physical intermodal assets to support the industry. We have top-notch university and community college system, and we're just a great place to live, work, play, and pray, and we're the envy of the world, right? That's that's the catch for the envy of the world. So we can make a great um, we can make a big a great business proposition in that space. But we also, with all of those assets, we want to make sure that we articulate what values are really important to the state of North Carolina. And those things include we want to make sure that these projects benefit and bring North Carolina workers to those projects. We want to make sure that these projects contribute to state economic development opportunities and where feasible that they provide for diversity, equity, and inclusion at, when it comes to procurement. 
for you know, meeting those supply chain needs. We want to make sure that those investments are made with thinking about how the industry and the sector will work together with neighborhoods and communities such that we're not, we're not um, imparting any externalities or disproportionate impacts on, the, on neighborhoods and communities due to infrastructure impacts. We are looking also at environmental considerations. We would prefer projects that mitigate environmental and natural resource impacts, including those two that could impact commercial and recreational fisheries, marine resources, birds and bats, and, and wildlife, as well as the human communities that we all that we all work with and live in. We reiterate our commitment to com communication and outreach and engagement making sure that the project developers continue to engage with all communities that might be potentially impacted, all stakeholders, and that includes our tribes across the state, um, federally designated, state designated, and non-designated. And then lastly, we would like to see pro uh, project developers with a demonstrated record of success so that um, in order to meet our offshore wind energy development goals, within the timeframes that are articulated in executive order and in meeting the Biden administration's goals, that we do that in accordance with all of those, in addition to dockets that are issued by the Utilities Commission, such that we advance affordable clean energy, and we wanna see that done in a timely and most efficient fashion. And so that's, why, that's where that last piece comes in. This is it's a two page document. It should be an easy read. I encourage y'all to take a look at that and um, we'd be happy to answer any other questions you have. We'll be watching the results of the auction next week. So I'm on a little off track there. Well, not off track, but sidetracked. But do we have any questions for Jennifer? The task force wit. I had a question, Jennifer. Did you say it was 20 miles offshore? Yes, sir. Where the, the new location is? At the leading edge of the area is 20 miles. And um, I'm not knowing where the best placement of those, of, of the towers and the wind arrays would be. I mean, they could even be further, um, further seaward. And that's further than was, was talked about earlier, right? Correct. <clears throat> Correct. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Um, we're a few days away from that auction. So November, I'm sorry. Action, but uh, <laughs> the lease auction. <laughs> May 11th, we're just a few days away from that. So by the time the task force reconvenes, we'll have a lot more to talk about. We'll know who's invested in our Carolina Long Bay area, and that will certainly inform some of how we proceed. Thank you, Jennifer. Welcome. Thanks, everybody. Now we're asking our co-chairs for the Economic Opportunity and Business Development Subcommittee to report out, welcoming Shell Query, Director of Economic Development for Carteret County. And Justin Sosny is joining us virtually. Justin is the head of the UK government's North Carolina office. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And hello, Justin. <laughs> Hello, Michelle. And Michelle, if I could ask you to speak closer to the microphone so that is that better? Um, yes, that is. Thank you. I'm animated and loud, and I don't want the feedback. All right, we need some animation now. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so good morning. Thank you all um, for allowing us to report out today. We've been doing some really great work, and I would like to um, thank the other members of our subcommittee. Who, if you would raise your hand, if you're on our subcommittee and just uh, be recognized. Thank you so much. And then also I would like to um, shout out to John Harden because the work that we're doing is is really and with support and direction from John and he's very thorough and it's just been a joy to, to work on this issue with John. Uh, we have a, a PowerPoint presentation for you today and Justin you may have to get me to move the slides forward for you, which I'm happy to do, but we're going to kind of do a two part thing and Justin's going to overview the work we've been working on and then we'll talk about some of the, the work that we've actually done and then look forward to feedback from the from the task force as a whole. Great, Michelle, should I should I go ahead and jump in? I think we're. <laughs> 
Do we have the PowerPoint available? There. Economic opportunity and business development. And while we're waiting for that, uh, just a reminder for our virtual audience, the PowerPoints from today's presentations will be available on the NC Towers website. So please don't uh, hesitate to go to that and check out for the PowerPoints, but also other information on what the task force is doing. And I will acknowledge our other subcommittee members for the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee. Chris Chung, Brian Clark, Dave Goss, Hayes Frame, and of course our staff liaisons, John Harden and Colin Kaiser, who um, did a, put a lot of work in for us and moved on to another opportunity, which we are um, happy for Colin. But uh, uh, joining us in his stead is Susan Fleetwood, Executive Director of Economic Development for Department of Commerce. Justin, do you have the latest um, PowerPoint and would you like to do a share screen? Uh, I do, Michelle, but not, uh, I'm actually joining on my personal device. I totally, so. totally get it. I was just trying to do a, a quick workaround since we had you virtually, but. Yeah, I, I could go ahead and start though, if uh, I think I can speak in, in, in spite of not having the slides in front, if, if in the interest of time, if that makes sense. I defer to the chairwoman. Would you like us to wait a few moments or? Uh, let's ask our AV people how close we are to being able to access that. Is it available? Okay, why don't we just switch around uh, our agenda a little bit while they while we try to get the proper PowerPoint and we'll go ahead and let workforce present now and then we'll come back to economic development. Our workforce subcommittee members include Perry Harker, Dan Sevilla, Kevin Dick, Secretary Walter Gaskin, Bob Peel. Phyllis Craig Taylor and Alvin Warwick. Our co-chair presenters are Perry Harker and Dan Segovia. Segovia. Dan, Segovia. tell me what it is. Segovia. Segovia. You got it. Okay. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Dan Segovia. I represent the Iron Workers in the Carolinas and co chair to the Workforce uh, Development Board uh, to uh, Perry Harper. I'm happy to provide the report today. During our inaugura inauguration task force meeting, we reviewed the purpose of each of the subcommittees. We've continued to refer back to the mission statement in our subcommittee meetings and are current, currently focused on credential attainment, labor, and diversity. We see the slide above. We're set to evaluate North, North Carolina offshore wind workforce development challenges and opportunities, identify policies and programs that foster a diverse, highly skilled offshore wind workforce. We're set to foster partnerships among educational institutions, businesses, trades, and stakeholders best equipped to implement the offshore wind task force or workforce recommendations. Below are some of the topics uh, that we consider uh, K-12 schools, higher ed, potential attainment, labor, pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships, uh, Department of Labor registered apprenticeship programs, uh, aligned curriculum, 
work-based learning, workforce pivoting, military separation, military placement, um, cross-training, and diversity. Included in the, in the report, 48 specific rec recommendations to prepare, facilitate, or accelerate the growth of the development of offshore wind in North Carolina. Pages uh, 90, 98 to 97 highlight opportunities in the workforce development. Offshore wind workforce needs are split into two main categories, traditional manufacturing jobs for supply chain and construction operation and maintenance jobs for wind turbines. North Carolina's strong manufacturing presence sets us up for a significant and diverse offshore wind workforce. We determine that both recommendations, 34 and 35, were achievable with the resource available within the Commerce and the Task Force. We also noted that the Department of Commerce recently released a list of nine degree credentials of value. Conducting a, a job skills analysis for offshore wind occupations would allow us to add offshore wind relevant credentials to this list that lives on North Carolina or nccareers.org. We also determined that recommendations 36 and 37 are achievable with the resources we have available. The subcommittee discussed that we could help foster a partnership between universities, NC Works, local boards, K-12, and industry to elevate the offshore wind opportunities and the training needed to prepare, prepare for these jobs. <clears throat> After discussing each of these goals, the subcommittee unanimously decided to adopt four of the offshore wind chain supply chain report recommendations as our 2022 subcommittee goals. We combined two of the recommendations into the third goal. In order to, in order, in your folder, you'll have a handout that lists each of these three goals and immediate deliverables. The three goals are as follows. Number one, conduct a job skills analysis for construction, operation, and maintenance needs faced by the offshore wind industry. Conduct an analysis at an occupational level to determine skill gaps training and training needed to prepare a qualified workforce in, in wind. Uh, we have a deadline of November 2022. Number two is to develop an inventory in, industry relevant related training available today. We will work with relevant stakeholders to identify existing public and private options already available from the NCCS and other training providers. We're, we will promote the training opportunities in North Carolina education and workforce systems into the offshore wind industry. All three have a Deadline of November, to, uh, well, I'm sorry. Deadline for the number three is uh, December. Goal number one, uh, to get, conduct the skills analysis for offshore wind occupations. So to accomplish each of the three goals, we formed three committees. The first goal, like I said, is uh, to conduct an offshore uh, skills analysis for offshore occupations. And the committee members from the subcommittee on this goal will be our Perry Harker, Secretary Gaskin, Alvin Warwick, Dr. Jenny Harris, uh, Dr. Andrea DeSantis, and Emily Roach. The two deliverables 
listed on the slide above, identifying the top high leverage occupations that re will require new skills and training and partnering with Commerce's Labor and Economic Analysis Division to analyze the occupations using nccareers.org and ONET. In addition to working on the two deliverables, the committee is working on working with LEAD to scope the project and determine the most useful end product. We know that many of the wind energy occupations have transferable skills that do not need to be analyzed. We're working to identify a smaller list of high leverage occupations that we can analyze in order to determine what training gaps exist so that we can make recommendations to fill those gaps. The second goal is to develop an inventory of industry relevant training already available to offshore wind occupations. The committee members on this goal will be myself, Perry Harker, Phyllis Craig Taylor, Alvin Warwick, Bob Peel, and Dr. Andrea DeSantis. The, the, the deliverables we plan to accomplish by June 2022 are to identify relevant training opportunities available to, to the pub, from the public, NCCS and UNC system, and to provide and, and private providers. Also to identify best practices and training opportunities available in smart power states. To date, we have identified wind energy, engineering, and energy programs, and associated academic degrees offered by the UNC system. Our task in progress with the NCCS and independent colleges and universities. BOEM is offering a bidding credit um, that allows a bidder to receive a 20% of its cash bid in exchange for contributing to high quality workforce development. <clears throat> the Ironworkers National Training Fund currently working on a facility, this is a plug for me, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> to train the workforce in the GWO basic, basic safety training. These five, ba five basic modules are working at heights, first aid, sea survival, fire awareness, and uh, material handling. I also believe my co-chair, Perry Harker with uh, Carteret College is working on the same ability. <clears throat> the third goal is to promote offshore wind train opportunities in North Carolina education and workforce systems and to provide and, and to the offshore wind industry. The committee members on this goal are Phyllis Craig Taylor, Kevin Dick, and Emma, Emily Roach. The deliverables we'd like to accomplish here are to partner with an outreach with the outreach and education committee to, to ve develop outreach plan an outreach plan once the offshore wind skills analysis and training inventory are complete and to identify the target audience for initial awareness meetings. We know that the work on our third goal cannot really begin until we accomplish the first two goals. However, we're still thinking ahead to the time when we will be ready to share this research, research widely. And that concludes my report. Um, I'm happy to be here, uh, represent for the, for the workforce uh, committee, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan. And Perry is online with us virtually. Perry Harper, do you want to add anything to the report? You can no, I just appreciate Dan taking the lead on it, and I appreciate all the work of our committee members and the staff. Okay, thank you, Dan. Thank you. I do have some news hot off the press that was shared with us.
Concerning Madam Force, North America's Building Trade Unions in Orsted uh, just released a press press release today. Today, North America's Building Trades Unions (NABTU) and Orsted, the U.S. leader in offshore wind energy, announced a project labor agreement to construct the company's U.S. offshore wind farms with an American union workforce. A first of its kind in the United States, the National Offshore Wind Agreement sets the bar for working conditions and equity, inject, injects hundreds of millions of dollars in middle class wages into the American economy, creates apprenticeship and career opportunities for communities most impacted by environmental injustice and ensures projects will be built with the safest and best trained workers in America. It's authorized by 15 international union presidents and their local affiliates. So that North American uh, offshore wind energy agreement covers all of Orsted's contractors and subcontractors that will perform offshore wind farm construction from Maine down to Florida. But I imagine once those skills are learned, they, they certainly won't be limited to that one company. So that was just uh, released today by Orsted. So something for our workforce subcommittee to think about. And I think we're set now for the economic. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve, you have a comment or question? Just a quick comment. Um, I was looking at the tasks and uh, I appreciated you starting with the BVG supply chain report as your starting point for discussion since I actually drafted a lot of that. So good to know it didn't go to waste. Um, but I did have a question um, in the inventory discussion uh, in goal two. There are a lot of programs that are kind of what I would characterize as non-traditional training programs that are kind of scattered across the UNC system uh, and across the community college system. And actually there's some private training programs. So I, things like uh, the training programs that are administered in clean energy by App State's uh, Energy Center, the Center for Energy Research and Technology over at A&T and my own center at NC State. Uh, that don't probably show up on the radar screen at the UNC system office. So I was just going to encourage you to, there may be some places we could chat about to dig a little deeper to find stuff. Uh, a and in particular has a renewable energy apprenticeship training program for clean energy specifically that they're working on. They want to add offshore wind as a component of that. And uh, they're working with money coming from the federal government down through um, state energy office right now to fund that program. And they've got several grant applications out to the Department of Labor and EDA under the good job solicitation that happened recently. So if any of those hit, there may be some substantial resources to start some of that apprenticeship work. Uh, so just wanted to highlight that so that we don't miss anything when we're doing the inventory. Chris has a question. By what exactly those referred to? I would say I would say uh, high leverage is, is high, would be high skilled, uh, experienced, you know, training. Obviously, the workforce isn't that experienced at this point because it's a new facet of you know construction and manufacturing and all the above. So I would say the training still has to be established and uh, worked with with you know the, the trade la the labor unions, the, the community colleges, and so forth. Okay, thanks. I just wasn't sure what high leverage meant in that context. I've not heard that terminology before. Thank you. Yeah, but Greg, you may have to just speak loudly.
Justin. <laughs> And before we jump to economic development, I, I do want to comment. We've been talking about workforce and uh, certainly diversity, equity and inclusion is a big part of what our goals are in making opportunities available. Steve Callen mentioned uh, North Carolina A&T, certainly North Carolina State, had, uh, North Carolina as a state has a large number of HBCUs, but North Carolina A&T in particular graduates the largest number of black engineers of any college or university in the country. And so North Carolina A&T has been certainly a school of interest for many companies who are interested in diversifying the workforce, uh, particularly tapping into that engineer talent. So just wanted to mention that for those who don't know, uh, we do have that as one of our assets here in North Carolina. Now, thank you, Michelle, for your patience, and we're going to move on to the Economic Opportunity and Business Development Subcommittee report. Michelle. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the much anticipated Economic Opportunity Subcommittee report. Justin, are you with me? I am. I am, although I can only now see the slide deck and not myself, so hopefully you, you, you can see me. I think we're going to have to opt for hearing you and seeing the slide deck. So, okay, okay, um, that's if, if that's okay. But again, thank you for the opportunity to you know present the work that we've been doing. It's been very exciting work, and we have a great, very engaged subcommittee. It's a, it's it's just a pleasure to work with. And um, Justin and I have kind of divided this up into to two sections, and he's going to do the overview, and then I'll wrap up. And we really do um, anticipate and hope for you know meaningful feedback from the subcommittee because because that's going to help inform our work going forward. So with that, Justin. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle and, and Madam Chair and, and everyone in the room. Uh, just want to start by sending my, my personal regrets not to be there with you in person. Uh, very much looking forward to, to joining the next meeting uh, back in person. Um, so as uh, Michelle said, um, wanted to start uh, just by reviewing similar to the to the talent committee uh, what our mandate actually is and so uh, this is the overall charge uh, based on executive order 218 of uh, what the the overall commission is responsible for and so what we've done is gone through uh, and underlined uh, areas where we feel economic opportunity um, and, and business development is, is relevant so as you can see, I think it comes through quite clearly that that the work that this committee is is doing is very much foundational. Um, of course, with direct overlap and, and synergy with the other committees as well, but certainly uh, runs throughout the the work of the commission overall. So we also wanted to be very thoughtful about how we approach. Uh, our, our mandate and our mission, uh, both to ensure that we're effective and also not to also move too far beyond what the, the committee itself, and we can move forward on the slide, uh, I believe as well. Uh, so, um, uh, thank you. So, so what we wanted to focus on primarily as, as per the mandate is to research, evaluate, and, and recommend policies and programs. Uh, so, there are a host of other activities that will be necessary, some of which are being undertaken by other committees or being reviewed by other committees. Um, but just given the, the potential breadth of, of activity and, and focus, we wanted to ensure that, that we are making as strong of recommendations as possible, um, along with timelines and recommended actors and, and funders and those types of things, but, but to really focus in on, on the recommendation piece. So, uh, moving to, to the next slide, uh, so as, as was discussed earlier in, in a number of these reports, I think have already been referenced through, throughout the day. Um, so, first, we wanted to undergo a, a discovery process uh, because I think it, it doesn't behoove anyone to, to reinvent the wheel or perhaps the windmill at this point uh, or wind turbine at this point. So, we, we did our homework um, as others have done, it sounds like. Uh, and so um, these are just several of, of the main reports. I think the NREL one was mentioned, uh, several others from the Department of Energy. 
business network for offshore wind and of course the the north carolina supply chain report so before we jump into uh key takeaways from these reports um just a quick snapshot slide uh to, to reference as a reminder of just how significant the opportunity really is. Uh, so as this uh, graph illustrates, and we heard from Dana and from others, um, just, just the sheer size of the potential market. And I think to me, as, as someone who is not necessarily an offshore wind expert or in the space day to day, you know, it, it was quite interesting to see the transition, uh, if you look at the green bars into floating, as also was referenced earlier and as was illustrated, it sounded like in Bilbao at, at Wind Europe, um, and as was, I think, also referenced during the panel earlier about the, the getting ready now for that uh, inevitable uh, movement toward, toward floating is something that's quite important. But as you see on the right side of this, there's uh, the, the numbers are quite, quite staggering to, to think about exactly how much will need to be produced in order to achieve the goals that have been set. So next slide, please. All right, so 10 takeaways from the readings. Um, I was joking with John and, and Michelle and others when we were preparing these slides that, that I was gonna do this like David Letterman's uh, former top 10 list, but I don't think I'm nearly that witty or clever to, to do that. So instead, I'm afraid you're stuck with, with a much more boring summary. Um, but that said, uh, conceptually, what I, I think the way that, that I've been thinking about this and we've been thinking about this collectively as a committee is, is in, in sort of broad groupings or, or buckets. So if you think about the first three takeaways here, to me, they really speak to, and, and to the committee, they really speak to the need for balance, um, both in terms of the need for uh, imports from Europe, as, as has also been referenced um, several times, in which I can also personally speak to in my role from the UK and, and what I've seen in terms of the UK's capacity uh, and experience um, and balancing that in the short term and the need to source from Europe in the short term in order to meet the very ambitious goals that have been set, um, while also not crowding out the domestic supply chain development that, that Dana and others have identified as being so critical uh, to, to where the state wants to go in the offshore wind space uh, over, over time. And so some uh, like myself who, who may be relatively new um, to this space um, may be wondering why, in fact, there hasn't been such a large domestic offshore or why it's taking time for that to develop. Uh, and so a few things that I learned personally from the readings and that we discussed in the, in the committee. Um, so a couple of key facts. One is that it's in fact quite difficult apparently to transition uh, onshore capacity to offshore manufacturing, just given that they require different technologies, and I'm sure some of our industry partners on, on the line can speak much more specifically to that. Uh, also, it, we learned that the, the blades themselves and, and other parts are getting consistently larger as the technology advances. And so this is one reason why ports are, are so important and, and why manufacturing will need to take place at ports. Um, so these are just a couple of the things that, that we learned from some of the readings that were, were listed on the previous slides. Um, so then uh, I would say takeaways four and five really speak to, uh, again, the points that have already been raised around the importance of tier two and tier three manufacturing. Um, so here are listed some of the, the key industries, which again, have already been spoken to in great detail by Dane and others uh, as to their importance as, as North Carolina develops the supply chain. And then uh, for takeaways six through 10, uh, these focus on a whole, whole range of areas from the importance of knowledge sharing to, again, the centrality of ports to boat building, which, which we know is, is particularly relevant for the Northeast part of North Carolina and also research and development uh, as A&T was referenced, uh, NC State and other leading universities throughout the state, which is one of its its greatest assets, uh, potential competitive advantages. Uh, and, and I think as Dana perhaps alluded to, but, but maybe to put a finer point on what we've also learned and understood through the readings when it comes to supply chain is that uh, what's likely to develop is that uh, wh whichever uh, components are manufactured, they're likely to be supplied throughout the entire East Coast. So, so different parts will be developed, uh, say North Carolina and then shipped as, as Dana, I believe referenced in New Jersey or Florida or wherever, other parts of the East Coast and beyond. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind that, that when we are talking about developing these, these technologies and, and products that, that it could potentially be for, for the entire East Coast. 
Um, so next, next slide, please. Great. So I think at this point, I will turn it over to, to my intrepid co-chair, uh, Michelle, to, to take us through the next or step two of our methodology, which involved a survey of our subcommittees. Thank you, Justin. Um, and we just felt it was important for you all to understand kind of how we arrived at the point where we are today. We wanted to be really thoughtful and go through the readings and digest and understand, you know, more about the supply chain. And then it's been really fascinating today to listen to the panel discussion, to get some feedback and through the questions that, you know, really there are a lot of common themes that are that run, you know, throughout not only the subcommittees, but through the work that's being done in other states that we can, you know, take a look at and, and you know, hopefully implement here in the state of North Carolina. So it's been really interesting to, to hear some of the common themes and, and supply chain uh, conversations because, you know, it seems like supply chain is when we talk about economic development, that's the first thing that comes to mind. But as we went through the readings and, you know, Justin went through the key takeaways, we really want to make sure the subcommittee was kind of on the same page. We had general consensus about where we wanted to go because, you know, as we want to help maybe inform policies and, you know, best practices around these, the economic development aspect of this industry. So we did survey the subcommittee. Um, we did use the supply chain study. Steve, you'd be happy to know that that informed a lot of this presentation. Um, we there were 48 recommendations, and we felt like you know for purposes of discussion and to really get meaningful to be able to put some policies in place or inform best practices that we needed to narrow down some of some of those themes. Um, so the ones that are germane to other subcommittees, we eliminated. Some had a lot of you know commonalities. Maybe they were redundant. And so we ended up with 18 total recommendations that we felt like were very um, specific to economic development uh, recommendations where we felt like we could make significant impact. And so um, each uh, staff member and our staff liaisons ranked the uh, 18 recommendations. And this is where we ended up. So it's interesting because again, it just kind of reinforces a lot of what we've been talking about today. So to attract a short list of high tier anchor tenants before they finalize their plans elsewhere. And I think, you know, we do talk a lot in terms of, you know, is our window still open? Have we missed opportunities? Things of that nature. But when we look at the timeframes, this is a lengthy process. And it was kind of nice to hear that from some of our small businesses and our developers who are engaging in the supply chain actively in other states, there's still time. And so that's exciting to think that we can still inform best practices and make a real impact for our state and our economic development here in North Carolina. We're right on time. We, we got this, right? So another, um, the second, you know, highest ranked recommendation was to actively support existing companies and how, you know, how can we get them to pivot? How can we get them in the supply chain? And I think we heard from some of our businesses today how we can make that happen. And education is a big piece of that and how we can educate and inform our existing industry and get them engaged in this process. Maybe they don't even realize how they could pivot their existing lines of businesses to engage in this process because it's some of, you know, right now we're in a little bit of a place where um, some of the, you know, we don't know what we don't know on some fronts. And so the education part for our small businesses and our tier two and three to be able to engage them, I think is going to be a real priority for how we can inform best practices around that piece of the industry. Of course, we're, you know, all economic development driven. So we thought how important it would be to have a dedicated economic development team for the purposes of informing that supply chain, creating those opportunities for businesses to pivot and engage and attract and recruit. You know, that's always at the top of our list. But how do we um, get these? existing and new anchor companies access to the market and appropriate sites. So as you'll see, you know, kind of these top four bubbled up as as the thing that, you know, the committee felt like they could really put some some structure around, which is let's get our existing industry in the supply chain. Let's recruit the people that we need to come here to actively engage and create real economic impact in the state. As we move to some of the others, it becomes apparent that kind of our second priority is site development and looking at sites and making sure our sites are ready for this particular development and what's coming down the pipeline. So to explore the use of the Port of Wilmington, 
Moorhead City, Radio Island. I happen to live and work in Carteret County, so I'm a little um, partial to the Radio Island site, and there's a lot of opportunity there. But there's also opportunity at, you know, the port has a lot of facilities where there's a lot of opportunity to engage. And so we do talk a lot about Radio Island because it has a lot of great attributes, but we have other sites throughout the state. And so I think it became important as, you know, the subcommittee kind of indicated that let's work on that supply chain. Let's get these businesses pivoting and engaged and let's start working on these sites. Let's get them developed. Let's figure out what the needs are, how we can attract people, how we can make basically a, a shovel ready site. So, um, again, we go back to supply chain, um, um, engagement, but also, you know, a little bit about how can we incentivize? And I think, you know, talking about an economic development team, how can we build some incentives around recruitment? How can we build some incentives about engaging in the supply chain? If you're a small business and you really want to engage, but what a heavy lift to change your business model. How can we incentivize that? How can we help build you up so that we can create your success in this particular um, new industry? And it's exciting to think about attracting a new industry, right? So. There's that as well. And so we talked about, I think we came up with kind of three themes, which is let's let's engage the supply chain. Let's get our businesses engaged. Let's look at our sites. Let's see what we have available where we can attract and recruit. And then let's talk about how we incentivize all of these particular players to engage in this industry. I would, I would say those are kind of the main, you know, kind of buckets that, that we arrived as a, a subcommittee. So some of the things that we've been kind of batting around are, you know, the incentive piece, which I think we all kind of get excited about how, how we can build best practices or some, you know, ideas where we can, we can engage and help inform, you know, from our prof professional perspective. Um, cultivate and, and develop resources and, you know, funding is, is always the issue. We talk about these great sites that we have and, you know, building out the sites and recruitment, but we also have to talk a lot about that funding pipeline and from where it originates and who's going to basically be responsible for what and, you know, the particular development of building out this industry. Um, you know, let's take a look at, you know, our assets and let's document them. Let's create an asset map for what we currently have. And I think we've seen some of that and some others have spoken to that today. I think asset maps are going to be very important. And I know Dana was had a map about, you know, talking about these are all the things and, you know, you pinpoint right here. So it's it can be as simple as um, something that doesn't sound very simple, but asset mapping and then um, you have a big, a clear, a more clear picture. So. Um, these are some of the kind of open ended discussion that we're having and, um, you know, how do we really engage our marine industry, you know, Bob and, and uh, Glenn and I were talking about this earlier, you know, as we talk about manufacturing, manufacturing and components and moving and this and that, how do we make sure that our core industry, which is our maritime industry, which is spending all their time on the water, how do we engage that industry and is it, is it supply chain, is it, is, you know, is it other aspects of, of this development? And I think that's something that we want to discuss in an economic development context as well. So those are just some of the, the ideas that we're, we're batting around in addition to kind of the three places where we landed. And we feel like these comments kind of feed up into that as well. So our proposed next steps are to talk about the recommendations, the rankings we have, kind of where we ended up with kind of the, the three you know, kind of big priorities, get feedback from the full task force, and then we'll develop a short list and, and then begin developing some action plans. And maybe it, maybe it's action plan, maybe it's a best practice, but we want to inform um, some recommendations so that we can bring that back to the full task force and, and, and gain your feedback uh, as we continue our work. Justin, do you have anything to, to add to that? No, that was great, Michelle. Thank you. Do we have any task force member questions for the economic development subcommittee? Dan. So it's just a comment and back to uh, Christopher's question, I guess. The, can you hear me? I think we can. So the high leveraging, I guess, I guess for, for us, you know, indirectly relates to the workforce, but, you know, leverage the possibly leverage the developers 
or whoever wins these leases to the boom, you know, 20 percent, 20, uh, 20 uh, cash, uh, credit to their, to their bid to, and see what they're doing to what they're going to do with this to the, to develop, help us develop the workforce in, in the state. Workforce is certainly a, a driver of that economic engine. That is a big opportunity, and we do hope that Bone will note our preferences and desires when they uh, evaluate those lease bids. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Michelle or Justin or the committee? With that, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, we thank staff who supported this effort. Absolutely. This yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we're going to take a quick 10 minute break, a quick 10 minute break and come right on back for our final two presentations and wrap up. We're returning at 2.40.
it's close enough. Is that close enough, Steve? <laughs> Clean Energy Technology Center. Sorry. Sorry about that, Steve. And Ashley McLeod. Ashley is the Stakeholder Engagement Director. I actually got a new title, Marquita. <laughs> is, is that a new title? I'm Lead sure? Offshore Wind Public Affairs. Okay. All right. So everyone keep me. I didn't print new cards. Felt like that was wasteful. With Ivan Bridge Renewable, and she's uh, with the Kitty Hawk Project that's off of the coast of North Carolina coast. Ashley, turning yeah. it over to you. They are looking for our slide. This seems to be a common theme. Oh, there's probably the one that said last minute slide. Excellent. So um, thank you very much. And we just have a very brief report. And but I'm going to start even before I start with our committee report. You heard during the panel, which I thought was very, very good earlier, and Susan did a great job of, of uh, facilitating that. But NYSERDA was referenced many times. And I thought I would let you know what NYSERDA stands for. It's the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. And their website is nyserda dot ny dot gov. They mentioned a lot of the training that's available there, things that will help you learn. But as Steve brought up, there's a, they have a gazillion dollars for well, you know workforce development and all they're doing. New York as a state has has made a lot of investment, but NYSERDA is a great opportunity, and there's a lot for us to learn, which includes um, I have learned a lot from them in regard to outreach and environmental justice and those kind of things. So um, I just thought I would bring that to. Um, to a completion for you to know what NYSERDA stood for. I figured you probably got the NY was for New York with the rest. So, all right, so this is our quick, what we spent our subcommittee meeting doing here recently was we've had two. We spent the first one getting some information from the committee members. And then what we realized is we needed to be a little more um, uh, clear in what actually um, um, infrastructure is, what um, environmental justice is, and what inclusion is. So would you go ahead and just we're going to this was the basic starter, but can you go ahead down should be the next slide. One more that was our there we go. So what we've actually done is create some scoping statements to help us. Um, I think what you're going to realize is as as all we've listened to all of our reports is everything is going to be merging together where it's going to be overlap as Dana referred to as that Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap for all of our committees and so. We wanted to just to clear up what infrastructure meant for us. So infrastructure is the physical infrastructure relating to the construction and installation of onshoring the power with a goal of advancing our projects, mitigating environmental and natural resource impacts. So for clarity, it's all the, tra the transmission corridors. It's where the landfalls are going to take place. And then it's looking at those communities and the environment around it, the human environment, the physical environment, the in, you know wildlife environment, all of those environments that are in that as we're bringing the power ashore. Um, and so when we look at that with the environmental justice part of it, so this is actually from the EPA. We just adopted it. Why rewrite the wheel if it's you know, the wheel's already established? And so this is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, or enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And so be having clarity in regard to what environmental justice is. And then, then the next part is the inclusion, which is the principle why, by which the offshore wind sector shall engage the industry's community and stakeholders. So simply put, this all really comes down to meaning that everyone's needs are considered and all of their voices are heard to help government make decisions that will have, a, a, um, in fact, in, excuse me, affect the environments in which people live, work, and play with minimal disruption. And so that is kind of bringing it all to close. So this helps us give some guiding mileposts or you know, ways that we look at where we're going. So as the power starts coming ashore or as we're developing sites, so I was listening to Michelle's report from the economic development, as they're looking into these sites, where they might put manufacturing plants or those, you know, looking around that. So the, this committee will have some recommendations to things that other committees should consider as well as they're looking into what they're going to be doing, as well as to when Susan gets up here and talks about outreach. 
as far as that goes. Um, so what we're going to be doing next after we've defined this is we also have looked at the, um, the review facts and fundamentals for that the North Carolina Commerce um, Department put together that um, Jennifer referenced earlier. We're reviewing that and we'll determine um, how we want to um, you know, endorse or what we want to do with that in June. Um, and then also we're, um, in case you don't know, the, the department or DEQ of North Carolina has a community mapping system. And if you haven't had the chance to go on and look at that, that is what our committee is going to be reviewing next to go and look and start understanding the um, underserved areas and where some of these land falls and, and the, the, the corridors and that might be going and how they might be getting there. The frustration, of course, as Steve has pointed out, is that we don't know where these are going to be. And I'm letting you know as a developer, we're still, you know, Kitty Hawk is moving forward, but we don't actually can't say exactly where our landfalls are going to be yet. So really what this boils down to also is making sure that we're, that means it's the whole coastal community. It's everywhere. We need to reach out because it shouldn't be just where the landfall is happening. It's what opportunities do we have to go and help all of our communities um, still grow and thrive and and um, and collaborate and work together and be in an environment all together, all playing in the same sandbox per se, all in the same the, the water and that kind of thing. Um, so that is really super quick, just what our committee is doing. Uh, we have a meeting again on June the 21st. And Steve, do you want to chime in with any other comments or we're happy to take any questions folks have for us? Yeah. Not, nothing to add. I think you covered it pretty well. We're we're kind of looking forward to seeing what the results of the auction are and how we can move forward from there. And, uh, you know, obviously lots to get done. So uh, time is of the essence. I think with environmental justice, too, it's and and she's going to talk about this next for outreach is just that it's the way we're getting out there and making sure people understand they hear offshore wind and they don't understand how that can impact the community. They don't understand, you know, when Kevin and I had a great talk about, you know, loans for small businesses and those kind of things and how it impacts and what opportunities are there. So that is still part of it as well. That's where I, I, I feel strongly that that we just all of our committees do have some overlap and that we hope we can influence and provide, um, you know, support for all of the committees to do their due diligence so that we can develop this and you're always going to have your folks who are not going to be excited about this new industry because it's new change is difficult for people but the better we can do and the more outreach we can do and and explain it well it's, it's just going to move it forward and that's why we're here as a task force is to move these projects forward and bring this industry to north carolina so if there's no questions that's that's quick. are there any questions for ashley or steve all right thank you ashley but i will say that uh Governor Cooper and his, this administration support the responsible development of offshore wind, and that's why he convened NC Towers to bring together stakeholders from government, industry, and academia, along with environmental, wildlife, and marine advocates to advise the governor's office and the General Assembly, which we know that's a part of what our, uh, our charge is, on the responsible development of offshore wind in North Carolina. Our efforts, along with the Federal Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, their process that invites a wide range of stakeholders to the table to actively participate in the responsible identification of areas for development of offshore wind and to address stakeholders' concerns. Again, that's why we're here, to address stakeholders' concerns. And any offshore wind development in the federal waters off the coast of North Carolina will also go through the BOEM evaluation process, and they're very, uh, intentional about inclusion and making sure that outreach uh, has been made to those uh, interests such as wildlife, marines, the fisheries, uh, communities that have uh, had negative impacts or could potentially have negative impacts. So uh, NC Towers, again, is just the latest effort for Governor Cooper to be mindful of how the state approaches offshore wind. Uh, we'll hear from our outreach subcommittee next, and certainly um, in terms of reaching to stakeholders that have varied interests is why we have that subcommittee. And uh, we hope that if there's anyone who has a voice that they want to be heard, they will reach out to us as well if we haven't uh, contacted you already. So. Moving on to the outreach, we have Susie and Mayor Cahoon. Susie Hamilton 
is the consultant for North Carolina Economic Development Consultant for North Carolina Department of Transportation and Mayor Ben Cahoon, Mayor of Nags Head, North Carolina, <laughs> presenting for the Outreach Committee. Thank you, Chairman um, Welton. And we're glad to be with you this afternoon and of course this morning and last night as well. Um, so are, are you ready for me to start? Okay, okay. Um, I'll try not to read to you from the screen too much, but um, it's important, I think, that we acknowledge what our uh, uh, task was uh, as the Outreach and Engagement Subcommittee. Obviously, it's to identify and engage offshore wind stakeholders in North Carolina and beyond with a communication strategy that advocates for the policies that we're prioritizing for offshore wind development. But to Ashley's point um, a few minutes ago, I think that um, it sounds to me like it's time for our subcommittees to perhaps meet together um, to begin to, to partner on these strategies um, as well. Uh, we're promoting recommendations from the task force as a whole to the stakeholders and our policymakers. Uh, we want to connect governments and organizations that work in this field um, to help us with advancement in North Carolina, build upon current partnerships such as the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic Regional Transformative Partnerships of Offshore Wind Energy Resources, Smart Power. I, next time I'm not saying it all, like I'll just remember Smart Power. Um, topics to discuss and consider that we've, that we've done so far is messaging priorities and consistency of messaging across the board. Um, what our outreach strategies should be, how we engage state government, federal government, and local government as it relates to offshore wind development, also our special interest groups and best practices among similar efforts. And um, those, uh, it's, it's a great big list, but we think it's a doable list, particularly because of the diversity of um, our group, NC Towers, and um, the folks in the room that represent um, a very diverse group of interests. So with that, I will turn it over. Oh, and I should thank our commerce liaisons, Jenna Renfro and Je Lex James, uh, for keeping us organized and on task. So thank you. Thank you, Susie, for getting us started. Uh, Gina was concerned she had not adequately prepared us to come up here and talk about this topic. And I said, Gina, you have two politicians standing up here talking about something is not exactly a problem that we have. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if you're an outreach committee, you need people to whom you may outreach. And so we have started developing a list of uh, preliminary list of stakeholders. Uh, this. Um, is set up in a spreadsheet, so it will be sortable in a number of ways. We can identify communities and groups uh, within this uh, set of individuals. Um, this came from members of our committee who represent various interests, and we all contributed um, a list of names and looked through our sort of contacts and our associations to develop this, um, this initial list along with a base set from the Department of Commerce, uh, Economic Development, Audubon, Environmental Defense, um, Southeast Wind Coalition, and others. Um, and, um, but we do know also what we don't know, and that is who is missing from this list, which people, uh, which organizations. And so you're probably gonna wish you had drifted away during the last break because our committee actually has work, subcommittee has work for you to do. Um, so we have an ask for you, um, and that is to help us uh, fill out this list. We need you to think through your contacts, um, your communities who may be interested in the work of this body um, or who may inform the work of this body um, that we need to reach out to. So we would ask you to review the list, which I believe was emailed to, to all members of the task force. Review the list, think about groups, think about individuals, identify any gaps that we may have in this list of stakeholders, um, and provide that information to us along with as much contact information as you have for them. 
And your second round of homework includes uh, reviewing the draft survey that the committee has put together. Um, the survey obviously is in an effort to gauge attitudes, get information, understand the needs um, of the communities and the level of engagement in which they may be interested in so that we may avoid the mistakes of the past with this kind of major energy um, development. So um, believe, I don't know if they've been sent yet, right, Gina? They've not. So following this meeting sometime today, um, tomorrow or early next week, you'll be receiving a copy of both the list and the survey, and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, so we are in the process of outlining a number of roundtables and listening sessions. Um, and I even like I, like I heard this morning during the panel discussion, the term uh, roadshow, and we're not we're not ready for roadshow yet because we don't have the content, but we do need to start um, talking to and listening to folks and and informing. And it was said this morning more than a couple of times is start the conversations early. So we need to get we need to get this ball rolling in terms of engagement. Um, so we would like to, um, if possible, plan and conduct three roundtables this summer um, with groups that we can identify. Um, conduct additional roundtables after. The task force has completed more of its work and we have content to carry forth uh, to these groups and distribute information that has been developed by the task force to these to these groups. Um, in terms of one of the other things we've talked about are listening sessions and that is and, and this is where you can also help. What are those conferences? Who are those groups? What are those organizations? that are engaged in um, some related way to our work to whom we should be talking, that we should be going out to, uh, should be engaging with, should be listening to, not roundtables or events that we have planned, but events that are already out there where we can go and engage and listen to, um, to those folks. And um, so in terms of your homework uh, for, for this slide, um, Recommend related organizations for listening sessions. Um, recommend conferences and roundtables, again, by others where our participation might be helpful. And suggest roundtable locations, include, and this is, for, this is for hours. I need to dis, um, distinguish this last item. Uh, when we go out this summer to do these roundtables, remember, we don't have a budget. So we need venues. Uh, where we can hold these roundtables. And we're preliminarily thinking Southern Coast, Middle Coast, Northern Coast. Um, so not only do we need to know what those communities are in those places who we need to invite to those roundtables, we need suggestions for where we might hold those, uh, might hold those events. Free venues are a great thing. Um, before we go any further, I'd like, if you would, everybody that's participated on our subcommittee is assigned to our subcommittee. If you would just raise your hands, you too, Carly. Just and let yes. me just say the subcommittee members include, uh, in addition to the co-chairs, Mayor Ben Cahoon and Susie Hamilton, Greg Andect, David Kelly, Representative Greer Martin, Jamie Simmons, and Whit Tuttle. And our staff liaisons are Lex. James and Gina Winfrow. And Carly, your last name just flew right out of my head. I, uh, thank you. I apologize. From um, Southeast Wind Coalition and uh, her, her yeah. colleague here uh, um, have also been instrumental with the subcommittee, and we appreciate that. Um, so um, to Ben's point a few minutes ago, we're working on a framework right now, a roadmap, if you will, for um, where we go and to who we present without having um, created any uh, content uh, at this stage, it, because we believe that the creation of the content for what is shared is, is um, going to be a, a more collaborative effort. And um, so what we're looking at um, at this stage is, is uh, throwing some ideas out in terms of how we communicate it, where we communicate it, where that infrastructure exists. So um, visual displays, obviously with the, the messaging to be developed, uh, displays physical and virtual using QR codes, um, tabletops uh, with a QR code on it for more information that we can place in public places, um, 
and the Southeast Wind Coalition offshore wind visual visualizations are a really great existing resource that we want to certainly integrate into our messaging. So um, another uh, request from the task force members is to suggest these high traffic environments where displays might take place. Think uh, visitor centers, um, uh, tourism development authorities, uh, things of that nature. Public libraries are another wonderful resource. And um, also suggest from you all some of the, our appropriate partners for distribution. So just to re reiterate what your homework is, uh, le leaving here today, uh, Advance the slide. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You left the one page from me. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there is another part of this, and they are the one pager uh, fact sheets that could be distributed in a, in a number of ways. Um, Southeastern Wind Coalition um, is creating a one pager with details about the Wilmington East Wind Ener Energy Area, um, and that yeah, you know, paired with those visual visualizations is a tremendous resource that we can already begin to use as we develop additional resources that are that are like that. These uh, one pagers and fact sheets will be beneficial as we go forth into the roundtables. Things that we can carry to listening sessions to begin to inform folks about the work of this uh, of this task force. And um, so your homework for this from this slide is to share any fact sheets, one pagers, any any kind of information that's already been created um, that, that's out there that may be related to any of the topics that have been discussed today. I, anything that will inform a shareholder, the public about the work of this body and in any related way, that's, we know there are a lot of resources already out there uh, floating around and those that can be shared with us for fine tuning and then distribution would be tremendously helpful. Okay, last slide. This is just reiterating um, what we we're requesting from you all to assist us in our work. Obviously, we drew, uh, with, uh, review the stakeholder list. <laughs> Sorry, it's a 700 plus per, uh, you know, uh, entity list, but, um, Perhaps you could do it in the reverse. Think of the people that you should think should be on it and then check and see if they are or are not. How about that? Um, and provide contact information if you do add someone, please. Re review the draft survey that you'll receive and let us know what you think. Um, the offshore fact sheets that Ben was just discussing, I think those are really pretty critical. Uh, if we could, Gina, is it okay for them to be sent to you? Um, and then we will compile them, and I think that would be a useful exercise um, for us to bring back to the task force as a whole. Uh, Roundtable locations, remember, free venues uh, and where these events and activities may already be holding um, some sort of listening session or work session on it. Uh, we'd love to, to, to know about those to see if there's somewhere where we can, we can plug in. Um, conferences and roundtables, again, where our participation might be beneficial. Um, I really came into this knowing next to nothing about offshore wind, and that's probably still the case. But what I have learned a lot about are the conferences and roundtable discussions that are going on within North Carolina, within our communities throughout North Carolina, and also in other states and overseas. So I think there's a lot of uh, knowledge out there that we have access to through those efforts. And finally, um, thinking about and suggesting high traffic environments for us uh, to put out the information that we pulled together. And we're happy to answer any questions. So we have any task force member questions? Dan Segovia. Thank you. Uh, is there a budget for outreach or? <laughs> no. No. Right. You heard that key phrase they kept repeating yeah. three places for meetings. Yeah. <laughs> That's why. I, <laughs> I got you. So I, I think a, a more economical um, resource for outreach, if there, I guess, if there was a, was a budget, would be geofencing. You know, as opposed to billboards and, and you know, paper advertisements, it's a more cost-effective way 
for, for, for outreach. And as, as far as outreach goes, I see the outreach, uh, I think, is geared towards the communities. And, and is there outreach towards the developers or manufacturers coming to the area? We, we've talked a lot about um, communities and stakeholders, um, and but that is not to imply that the, the communities and stakeholders don't also include uh, the, the groups of which you speak, developers, contractors, manufacturing folks that might have an interest. Um, so yeah, it is, um, we rely heavily on our partners at EDPNC and Commerce for those recruitment efforts, and we want this messaging to be consistent with what they feel they could use to, to, to recruit business and industry to the state. We have other questions. I, not a question, just a comment to add to as as a person going out and doing this kind of engagement for the, the Kitty Hawk project specifically. Um, it would be great to have this piggyback on. So I mean, working with the developers to be able to go and say, OK, you guys are doing roundtables. Can we come with you to show the support of NC Towers? So it does make a lot of sense to do that. And there's already I mean, I know that Jamie and her team has already created a lot of of one sheeter type things, but also developers have like we have a really fun fact how offshore wind works just to make it easy. So don't reinvent the wheel and let us, you know, provide those kind of things. So exact work, work smarter, not harder. That's right. <laughs> and we do have several key companies represented on, on our task force so they can be instrumental in supporting that as well. Yeah. I do want to mention and thank you, Susie. Thank you, Mayor Cahoon. Um, I do want to mention that I think we failed to say who the members of the infrastructure subcommittee are. And just so everyone knows, because we do have folks who are you know, public who are listening virtually and may not know this information, but uh, Steve Callen and Ashley McLeod are the co-chairs and they present it. But committee members include Daniel Gavoni, Kevin Lackey, Mark McIntyre, Trish Murphy, and Glenn Skinner. That uh, subcommittee is supported by, supported by staff liaisons Dana Magliola and Jennifer Mutt. So, all right, that concludes all of our presentations for today. And I think we, I won't say we were overwhelmed with information, but we certainly were. <laughs> we <weren't overwhelmed. laughs> you received a lot of information, and um, perhaps you have some thoughts that you want to reflect on right now with the committee as a whole. We've heard about the need for North Carolina to have greater visibility and outreach. Certainly just talked about that. Education to educate our citizens on what this is. We're learning, but as we learn, we need to share that knowledge as well. Um, and, you know, another thing, uh, the opportunities for offshore wind is not just for Eastern North Carolina. It's for the state as a whole, number one, but also um we can we're not just supplying for north carolina we have opportunities for the entire eastern shore and and beyond really so we have a lot to think about as we develop um our thoughts and recommendations that we will eventually make to the governor and to the legislature and i open it up right now for general questions or comments or thoughts that uh, committee members would like to share Secretary Gaskin. Thank you. Um, can you can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, I've heard a lot of information that discuss security internal to where the windmills will be or the ports, but I have not heard or do we need a committee to talk about security as it relates where these windmills are located. Um, as you know, the Coast Guard goes out to three miles and anything out past three miles belongs to the Department of Navy and Federal Government. Uh, we do that same sort of security for the uh, all platforms that we have out. That's the national security issue. And that may be something that may be something we'll tap into you as our military expert to uh, guide us in, Secretary Guest. Any other thoughts on security? Yeah, is this on there? I think it's on. Yeah, here it goes. You know, I uh, I haven't heard much today about our relationship with Virginia and Maryland, that, that group. 
and how that relationship helps what we're doing here as a task force. And, uh, and I think for me, because of our close relationship to the Port of Virginia, you know, I'd like to see more of how all of these activities help support that relationship. That's an important point. And as you know, we have an MOU signed between the three governors for Virginia, North Carolina, and Maryland for smart power. Jennifer Munt, who is our uh, Clean Energy Assistant Secretary, also served as president of Smart Power for the last year, for the first year of its, its existence. I think that's transitioned to Maryland now. But Jennifer, can you comment on what uh, that partnership is doing? Oh, John, okay. All right, John. Is this working? Working now. So good handoff, Jennifer. So um, I should note that one thing I failed to mention in my remarks about the uh, IPF meeting earlier was actually two important things. Number one, we had a collective booth on the exhi exhibition floor, uh, collective meeting Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. And it was one of the largest booths on the exhibition floor. And it was very open and welcoming because it had no walls on it. And so it was a centerpiece of that. And it allowed us to really market and brand the region as a collective region. And that may sound a little fluffy, but it's actually very important because most people, especially in Europe and other countries that are familiar with offshore wind and work in that space, don't really think of the mid-Atlantic as being the hotbed of that right now. And I think smart power is changing that perception some. And so that's really important. Second, at the conference, we had a, a, a session, a panel session, where representatives from each of the states was a, were able to talk about their respective efforts as well as the collective efforts. And the question that comes up all the time is, okay, we know you guys are a partnership, but what actually have you done? And uh, I can't say that we have passed any legislation together. I can't say that we have actively and successfully recruited a company to our respective regions, but I can say that we have established working relationships now that really matter because we are primed and ready when those opportunities come to, to work together. And we actually did come together on a collective grant application that we submitted for the um, Economic Development Administration's Build Back Better Regional Challenge Grant um, opportunity. We were not awarded that grant, but it's also the case that 90% of the applicants who did apply did, did not were not awarded that grant. And so, the work that we put into that grant was very valuable and will be used for other purposes. Um, but we have um, referred companies back and forth between the states. Um, and we are also working on, in addition to the collective branding and um, sharing information and best practices, we're also considering working on common um, energy transmission issues. Transmission is an issue that we haven't talked much about in this task force, but um, you obviously have to have power coming in um, from the ocean, but if you can't distribute it properly once it effective, efficiently and effectively once it's on shore, uh, then that's not good. And so we have ways to address that. We also um, can be a common voice when working with BOEM on possible new lease areas and, um, and things like that. So, so we are working um, together uh, but we're really pretty early on in this relationship. We're about a year and a half into it. And the way we described it at the conference was that you have to crawl before you can walk and you have to walk before you can run. And we're kind of at the walking stage now. And uh, Virginia, I mean, uh, Maryland um, has taken over as the um, chair and they are actively making plans and we are actively working with them on those plans. So stay tuned and more will be coming. David, does that address your question? Yeah, I'm just interested in how we can maximize the advantage of that relationship to answer some of the questions that each subcommittee is dealing with. I think that's a part also of what that smart power team does. And how regularly do you meet the smart power team? We meet officially orderly, but informally more often. Right. So, David, I think 
some of what you're getting at is what that team that was um, put together by the three governors is to focus on is what they're doing, the, the work that they're doing. And they meet quarterly, and as John said, sometimes uh, more frequently. One one thing I should note is um, we're required. Microphone, please. Sorry. I even okay, okay. Even though I swear I had it on and was talking to you. Okay. So, but as my wife would say, user error. And so, so. Um, one thing I should note is that we did prepare an annual report that we submitted to our to our governors to indicate what we had accomplished in the last year. It's relatively brief. It's a couple of pages long. But if you look through the list of things that we've accomplished, I mean, it's starting to add up over time. And so we can share that with uh, towers. And that's something we can probably add to our website uh, right. just so folks can track exactly what smart power means and what smart power is doing. Right, but uh, I, I really can't underestimate or underemphasize the importance of that collective branding at the conference. I mean, we got so much more attention than we would have as individual states uh, because we got a prime location, we had nice banners, and it was very open and welcoming. And people in other countries don't know the difference between Virginia and Maryland and North Carolina, but they would come to the booth and they would say, tell us what you're all about. And that allowed us to start the conversation. And the good thing is they could not go to see Virginia or Maryland without seeing North That's Carolina right. yeah. and vice versa. Same thing. It was great to be able to take folks that came over to our booth and say, let me take you and introduce you to these folks. And they all just gathered right around and it just was beautiful. <laughs> yep. Right. Thank you for that question, David. Any other thoughts or questions? I'm sure this is John White from Dominion Energy. Oh, John, recognizing John, who's with us virtually. Hello, I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you all today, but I just I appreciate David's point. Uh, David, you know, I, I really applaud the leadership uh, of uh, of Commerce and, and the governor's office uh, of bringing us all together. But to your point, um, the the relationship as it relates to Virginia um, and, and Dominion being added uh, to this task force, we we bring with us uh, all the things that um, uh, that that uh, you would need essentially to to have this conversation, uh, whether it be from the environmental justice uh, components all the way to the infrastructure. Given that we've been in the business for quite a while now, um, in terms of offshore wind, so I appreciate that point. But but it is really a dirt decision. I, I echo what John just just said. Um, and uh, I think that at the end of the day, people make a decision to either go to the southeast or they're going to make a decision to go overseas or to the northeast. And I think the, the regional approach to what it is that, uh, that John outlined makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, you know, from a Virginia um, headquarters standpoint, we're, we're fully in support of what's going on here in North Carolina. And as me being one of the one of the faces for the company here in North Carolina, I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this task force. And so. Anything that we can do, uh, we've got a lot of material that we've already uh, circulated throughout the web, a lot of things on the fisheries, videos, you name it. We've got a lot of product already out there that we're happy to share with this group, but I really appreciate that question. Yeah, and that is something, again, that was driven home from the companies that we spoke with at IPF conference. It's They may know the United States, because as you know, the U.S. is kind of late to this party, but um, our European counterparts have been in this industry for a long time. And uh, when thinking of offshore wind in the US, they think of the US, they don't necessarily think of an individual state. So it was important for us and good for us that we did have a regional presence. And again, so if they were talking to Virginia or talking to Maryland, they could not help but talk to North Carolina as well. And so. Uh, we'll continue with that partnership. Thank you, John. Uh, other questions? And again, we have a few of our members virtually. So if you have a question, please unmute and feel free to ask your question or make your comments. All right, Steve, I'm sorry, Steve. I jumped over Steve going to John. Now back to you, Steve. Just real quick, I wanted to let folks know uh, on a much smaller scale than IPF or uh, Bilbao, Spain, we did have the North Carolina State Energy Conference uh, about a week and a half ago now. 
we had about 725 folks come to the McKimmon Center or attend virtually. Uh, a lot of positive feedback on the conference as a whole, but notably there were two sessions on offshore wind, one kind of a generic roundup panel on where we are with discussions in the state, uh, a second panel that focused on transmission and offshore wind issues. Uh, those panels were both recorded. And so as a part of the larger conference, if anyone's interested, I can, if you wanted to shoot me an email, I'll get you a code and you can go in and look at those panels. Also, I will note that uh, Secretary of Commerce Sanders actually was one of our welcoming speeches uh, and she was uh, effusive and very positive about the clean energy opportunity for the state of North Carolina. She was a great speaker. She really helped to kick us off the conference right and uh, we were very happy to have her. So uh, I wanted to thank uh, everybody at Commerce that helped get that lined up uh, for us because it was a great way to start off the conference. Thank you, Steve, wonderful. And perhaps we can share that link on our website as well that people can have an opportunity to hear what uh, was shared at that conference. I think we can do that with the secretary's comments. The <laughs> session comments are part of the registration for the conference. Okay. So I'll have to go negotiate with the McKimmon Center, but uh, <laughs> we'll see All what right. we can do. Other thoughts? Again, we welcome our new members, John White with Dominion Energy, Arkita Howard with Crowley, Maritime, in case you don't know. <laughs> Daniel Govoni with Department, the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. And uh, John Richardson, who's not with us with the North Carolina Indian Affairs Commission. So we've had a long day. We've taken in a lot of information. You've been given a lot of homework to do. And I know uh, some of you are thinking, uh, I wasn't quite sure that I would have this much responsibility <laughs> when I said yes. <laughs> but we're so glad that each of you did. And we really appreciate your engagement and your commitment to this. And uh, I think I don't have to say it's very important to North Carolina's future, uh, not just for um, jobs creation and, and investment in the community, but we're talking about clean energy and we're talking about the environment and we're talking about those things that will um, sustain us, first, not just economically, but certainly environmentally as well. So the work that you're doing is important and appreciate it. Your, your time is very much appreciated. So with that, our next meeting is August 4th. The location is still being worked out to be determined, uh, but keep August 4th and 5th on your calendars. We do uh, plan to see you those days. <laughs> and um, if you have any questions about any administrative things, please reach out to Nicole Williams and she'll be able to work those things out for you regarding reimbursements and those sorts of things. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for spending yesterday and today with us. And we look forward to seeing you in August. Thank you so much. And this meeting is adjourned. So they were thinking of being the apologies. Would you? If you go.